Hi, Lily. Hi, Anna. What does the cheese say to the other cheese passing by? I don't know, Lily. What does the cheese say to the passing by cheese? To the cheese passing by? <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day. What? Sorry, I don't get it. Have a great day. Like a cheese oh. grater. So <laughs> Again, it has like nothing to do with passing. It's just that it had the word passing in the in in the joke and it came up and I was oh. like, sure. <laughs> I no, can't I, find I anything else. I wasn't even looking for connections. I was truly just being just like, what, what is this joke? That's so cryptic. No, what's the joke though? I was like, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> just this six-year-old's joke was just on another level. I'm Anna. And I'm Lily. And this is Liliana's pre-read Mediatic. The podcast where we analyze and discuss audience preconceptions of media from a queer feminist lens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about, I, I was kind of wondering about this now, are we saying passing or passing? Uh, I say passing, because um, like for me, oh. pass, passing is if you're really posh, you'd be like passing. Ooh, okay, interesting. Although maybe, I mean, there's different, obviously different dialects and I don't think there's a right or wrong way to say it, I guess, but I'd say passing, personally. Okay. We're going to talk about the 1929 book by Nella Larson, Passing, and also the 2021 film by it's Rebecca, a... written and directed by Rebecca Hall. Ah, oh, that's good, because I realised that we hadn't put anything about the writer in the script and I was like, my mum's going to get angry. Um, because she's always like the script writer never gets enough approved, <laughs> never gets enough attention. They write the whole script. Um, but it's Rebecca Hall, so fantastic for both. Okay, cool. And so the reasons I think we wanted to talk about these bit pieces of media was well, partly because we had very different viewing experiences on when we first watched the film. Because I watched the film having read the book. Um, I read it and watched it for a feminist reading group that I'm a part of. Shout out to Roxanne Douglas and Steve <laughs> Warren. <laughs> but yeah woo. um but yeah so I'd read the book or done an audiobook the book we'll talk about this more later but it had a very different kind of understanding and interpretation of the film to you and also my parents um, which I thought was interesting um, I think we were talking about what we had watched that week and you said that you watched Passing with your parents mm -hmm. and you'd ask me whether I'd read the book or whether I'd seen the film and Despite the fact that I do, we've, I've had this rant yesterday as well, despite the fact that I do think I keep up with what's out and like available already, Netflix did not push this on me at all. I That's didn't so know that weird. it was available just on Netflix. I could have just watched this any day and <laughs> I didn't know that it was out yet. And then I thought, wait, no, I did want to watch this guy. I read about this movie being made. So, and then you asked me like about the ending and... When uh, you were asking me, when you watch this, tell me about your ending. What do you think? We're going to talk about this later as well, because there's some ambiguity in that or yes, different so perceptions. Mm. <laughs> but um, yeah. it's very interesting. This also inspired me after watching the film. I was like, I need to read this book. And I also listened to the audiobook, which is public domain. You can just listen to it. And I highly encourage you to do so. Yeah. LibriVox yeah. recordings. We Thank you, LibriVox. <laughs> you saved my life. Thank After you. every chapter, though, this is a LibriVox recording. <laughs> every LibriVox recording, recording is, in is in the public domain. <laughs> <laughs> For more. Yeah. It actually took me, like, I'm not complaining. It's a public, public domain. Thank you for making this and giving it to me. But that took me more out of the world of the book. <laughs> every time they stopped to say that, I was like, Shh, just get to the next freaking chapter. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I think also it was, um, these texts are interesting because they bring up themes of perception, deception and interpretation, which was interesting to look at in our, from our lens of pre-read text and adaptation. And we're going to talk quite a lot about adaptation theory today and translating yeah. book to film. Yeah. Yes. So, and also thinking about a movie that's almost a hundred years and difference mm. between uh, writing the book, publishing the book and then making a movie. And the fact that this has never been adapted before. <laughs> We're yeah. going to talk about later why that is a little bit as well. It's just really interesting what a what hundred years and a different lens, literally and metaphorically, <laughs> yeah. will do to a text. So the plot of both the book and the movie is that during a hot summer day in New York, Irene Redfield, Rini, passes as white to cool off in a hotel. 
There she spots a woman across the room. And after fearing that the woman has realized that Irene is black, the other woman actually turns out to be an old schoolmate, Claire. Mm -hmm. Claire has passed for white for years now and has married a white man, but yearns for Harlem and Irene's and possibly Irene's husband's company. Um, her husband, John, does not know of his wife's visits to the Redfields, nor does he know that Claire is black. Claire's continued visits worry Irene, though, as she suspects that her husband and Claire are having an affair. John, Claire's husband, meets Irene with a friend on the street, and because of the other friend not passing as white, realizes that mm -hmm. Irene is not white. And after Claire returns from a journey in Europe, the Redfields and Claire attend a Christmas party at a friend's apartment. There, John shows up, having discovered his wife's secret. And as he approaches her, Claire and Irene stand near an open window and Claire falls out the window and to her death. You will notice that I worded this very strangely in the yeah, end because yeah. I kept yes. saying, how do I keep this open so we can still discuss it? But I also apologize because I hate the term falls to her death. That sounds yeah. uh, like a dude mm -hmm. wanting to never place blame on anybody in the newspaper or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're gonna but talk it's kind about of important it. that we yeah, yes. don't attribute exactly how she fell kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. I'm doing this intentionally not to um, remove responsibility from anybody. We, we're going to blame. We'll talk about it. We talk about yeah. that, yes. Yeah. So a little bit of background on the book. This book was published, as I said, in 1929 and written by Nella Larsen, who herself was born to a white Danish mother and a black father from the West Indies. Lola Larson's father died really soon, I think when she was like three, and her mm -hmm. mother married another, uh, married uh, a white man. And so Larson then, as a result, became the odd one out. Again, this is during Jim Crow. This mm -hmm. is very <laughs> different laws at the time. Um, she was always labeled less than, but also whenever she was around her mother and her half-sibling, they were also, as an extension, labeled less mm -hmm. than. Also because Larson, because her mother was Danish and her father was from the West Indies, she didn't really have Black American connections in terms of family. Oh. Like she didn't have a lot of connection to people in the South in America because she was a child of immigrants yeah. and the rest of the family was European and not necessarily in America, but the white part of the family also she didn't really have a connection with. And that's interesting as well, like what you were saying about her mother and her half siblings and kind of the relationality of race as well and kind of how it's so context dependent, which is obviously a theme within the novel and the film as well. Yeah. So the, after the book came out, uh, Larson actually got a really important fellowship. I think it was the Guggenheim Fellowship. But then she was accused of plagiarism. And despite the mm. fact that she was actually, she was not considered guilty of it. That was too much of an embarrassment for her. And she left public life and became a nurse. And she did not oh, wow. really talk to anybody ever again about her past life as, a, as an author. And she what? died. Yeah, she died in obscurity oh. pretty much. Ooh. Yeah. No, no, no. And she, a lot of people, when she's left public life, were exchanging letters about the fact that they didn't really know her that well in terms of her, her inner, like not just her inner thoughts, but also any sort of facts about her life or her family. A lot of people realized that they didn't really know her that well and how that's, sad that really was. That's really sad. So yeah. wait, did the novel, So because the novel wasn't that big at the time, right? It was only over, after like a while that it kind of like grew acclaim, I think, or it sort of was popular, then lost popularity, then like grew a lot of acclaim later on. I think it was a success, but moderately in certain circles. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people praised it at the time for being really good, but it didn't necessarily pass into, ma <laughs> pass into mm -hmm. mainstream success, but it still did well enough that she was mm -hmm. someone who was in certain intellectual academic circles. I think she was mm -hmm. quite revered, but the whole scandal of uh, the plagiarism accusation was just too much for her. Wow. And this was also her second novel. Her first one was called Quicksand. So, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you get like a little um, two book thing where it's like passing in quicksand. The reason you and I started talking about this book is because, not just because of the film, but also because we both remembered that this was something that was in a lot of footnotes or a lot of references about Black people writing about her, their identity and how that shifts. Yeah. And then passing was always used as a reference. And I realized I've heard this book being mentioned in so many academic papers, but I've never mm. read it. 
Yeah, it's inter- again, we're going to talk more about the academic discourse that cropped up around this book and how that's influenced how um, Rebecca Hall went about creating the film as well. Um, there's one thing in a letter uh, in 1932 when she was writing to Carl von Vechten, if you're Scandinavian, and I'm pronouncing that incorrectly, I'm very <laughs> sorry, who was a friend of hers, she talked about the experience of being in the Jim Crow South and just going about her day with a friend Grace Johnson and going actually into a restaurant and passing. They felt like it was the way it was described in the book that I read on this. Uh, they reveled in knowing that they had won a small battle against Jim Crow. Mm. She married a physicist and later divorced, which was quite, was written about quite cruelly mm-hmm. in newspapers. So she was famous enough to be written about, you know, and, um, yeah. but they, after they divorced, she didn't attend her ex-husband's funeral when he died because at that point she was already out of the, out of dealing with anybody talking about oh. her. And yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of impressive that she was like that famous or like that, that well-known to like be written about in newspapers and stuff that she managed to have that backing out from like into obscurity that was something i guess if this is pre-social media you've got to i guess yeah it's a different time so in some ways it's easier because you can just if people stop writing about you there's not the same paparazzi or like social media thing happening all the time so it might maybe easier to kind of drop into obscurity but that's really interesting um, i mean if that's yeah. what she wanted i hope i mean i hope but i don't know this i hope that mm. this is what happened in the way that it happened because she wanted to retrieve this way. I hope that there was some peace for her in making that cut from her life, but I'm not sure because she, again, for the rest of her life, didn't really have a lot of, as far as we know, contact with the rest of her family because she was black, because she was the Mm. black relative of all this, all these white people. She didn't really have that. And being sort of trapped between two poles and not being able to identify with either fully is mm. a topic that's going to come up again and again in yeah. <laughs> this movie. Um, and I also just wanted to mention the book that I talked about was, um, and I'm going to reference it again and again throughout this, uh, A Chosen Exile by Alison Hobbs, which is a very good book, actually. It's very interesting. Mm. So, um, as you may know by now, if you've been listening to the po- this podcast for a while, so we on this podcast are interested in the idea of a pre-read text, which is a term coined by Rowan Ellis, and it refers to when you haven't engaged with the source material of a story or piece of media, but you have a strong sense of what it's about through interacting with various adaptations of that original material. And so this kind of cultural consciousness of a story or characters, images, concepts from an original text kind of crops up, uh, which might have very little or nothing to do with the original source material, and instead all come from adaptations that come afterwards. And we'll also be looking more generally at the preconceptions which these members might bring to a piece of media as well. So for this week, I read some adaptation theory. Hooray! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which I've been, I think it was in maybe our first episode, either the introduction episode or our first episode, I mentioned that I did a module on Shakespeare and remaking Shakespeare, and we read some adaptation theory that I thought was actually quite similar to what um, Ellis was talking about. And I reread that bit of adaptation theory. So I reread What is Adaptation from Adaptation and Appropriation by Julie Sanders. She's basically de emphasizing the idea of the original text and emphasis that is put on the original text to, uh, to quote. As Andre Bazin, sorry again, that might be bad pronunciation, but as Andre Bazin foretold as early as 2000, in the new convergence culture, texts or encounters may well be understood not in a linear or historicized hierarchy of original and adaptation, but rather in terms of a single work refracted through different art forms, all of which are conceivably perceived as equal in the eyes of the user. But yeah, she also emphasizes the idea of the original text as being quite a slippery thing, kind of looking at is there ever an original text? Or so in the case of Hamlet, for example, there were like several different versions of the original Hamlet, and it, all of them were slightly different. And so it's quite difficult to place and we don't really know which one came first. Often, especially in sort of Shakespeare, it's very difficult to place that original text. Again, de-emphasizing the idea of the original text. Sanders also highlights the fact that adaptations are products of their contemporary socio-political conditions. So it's not just kind very of their drawings so. of the past. Yeah, exactly. And they're kind of drawing from like contemporary culture as well. And kind of questions the idea of whether you need to know a source fully to enjoy the adaptation and kind of like how that changes the experience. Which again, we're going to talk about more later. And also, just the, she kind of wants to emphasize that there is just a pleasure in seeing something that you previously enjoyed being adapted. And she's like, that's also important as well, and kind of shouldn't be de emphasized because that's kind of a big part of it as well. 
Yeah. I think it's interesting what you said about Hamlet because it's also true for a lot of folk stories. A lot of folk stories are told through telling them. So the idea of knowing which one is the original that's being adapted when you write a book of uh, like a novelization of it or a play version of it or whatever. Yeah. It's sort of impossible to pinpoint it original because no one knows where who started telling the story and yeah. at what point did it reach the form that we know today. And it's yeah. also kind of like stories are constantly moving and shifting, even mm -hmm. seeing that sort of like shifting, even in the origin of the text, in the adaptation, it's that kind of meaning shifts and changes, like with the pre-read text, what you imagine this text to be, um, and through adaptation, like how all of these different texts are kind of refracted, or the single text is refracted through all these adaptations, which kind of informs your view of that text, and they're all interacting with each other in this intertextuality, which doesn't mean that one text is obscured by another, but that they're kind of, or they, maybe it is, they're all interacting in interesting ways, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, also, okay, a bit more adaptation theory. So Sanders talks about Deborah Cartmel's three broad categories of adaptation. So that includes transposition, which is transposition between genre, which by that they mean medium. So from like novel to film, film to musical, musical to, I don't know, fan fiction or something. Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> which we do want to talk about at some point, like fan fiction is um, adaptation. Um, yes. But also like transposition in culture, geography, and temporality, updating Romeo and Juliet to be set in, uh, wait, where's Baz Luhrmann's, actually, is that set in New York? Or is West Side Story set in New York? Baz Luhrmann's is, I would say, very much West Coast. West Coast. So I haven't seen it, so I'm just in America. Uh, where's at, American? <laughs> mind you, I will say this is based on <laughs> no knowledge of mine, but it's at the beach. I mean, I've seen it. That's not what I mean. It's at a beach. It's very hot. And okay, it looks yeah. very much like Californian to me. And everybody okay. in it is. I think most actors in it are American, so I would say LA. Probably LA. Okay, so you've got cultural, geographic, and temporal shift, which is another part of transposition. So like genre and also all these other things. Yeah, just because I wanted to clarify it in case someone just heard this. And I know when you love something, you don't want someone to say something wrong about it. In Baz Luhrmann's Romeo, Romeo and Juliet, it takes place in, in Verona Beach. <laughs> Not in Ver not in LA, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh no, but that makes sense though. Oh, Verona that's interesting. Beach. Verona Beach. <laughs> so, and in our case, for passing, you kind of don't really have the cultural, geographical, temporal shift, but you do have that um, generic transposition from book into film. And then we also have commentary. This is achieved most often by offering a revised point of view from the original, adding hypothetical motivation or voicing what the, what the text silences or marginalizes. And I think that's, again, we're going to talk about this a bit more, but I think whenever you adapt something, you're always choosing kind of what you want that text to say or what you want your adaptation to say. So that could be you're repeating what that text has already said, or you change it a little bit, or you, again, voice something that's been silenced or marginalized in that text and kind of bring out themes that you've read or that you've kind of found in that original text. Like the girl boss feminism, the white feminism that is now being put into every Disney live action remake. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's a horrible, like, <laughs> bad version of what you just said. <laughs> Taking something and being like, this needs to be added to this to make it relevant. And you're like, um, <laughs> does it though? Uh, yeah, and that's another part of commentary is it can also be an attempt to make a text relevant or easily comprehensible to a newer audience and readership via processes of approximation and updating, which can have good and bad results. Um, <laughs> as much as anything is good or bad, but I think yeah. we can probably all agree that Disney remakes are pretty shoddy, to say the least. But yeah, and then uh, finally there's analog, which isn't particularly relevant to passing because it is pretty direct adaptation, but uh, an analog is basically what clues is to Emma. It's related, but not exactly the same thing. It takes elements. And then this brings up the question of how much a knowledge of a source is required to enjoy the adaptation, how much is merely enriching. Yeah. Yeah. I never realized that Bridget Jones' diary mm -hmm. is essentially Pride and Prejudice. Yeah. Because at that point I hadn't read Pride and Prejudice and I just assumed, also because Colin Firth is in it and plays Mr. Darcy, I just assumed that it's that's way too on the nose. <laughs> but it is sort of... <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having this, these three ideas of different versions of adaptation is super interesting because it is super important to always think about when something is adapted, who is adapting it? Why are they adapting it? What are they changing? What is the source material they're adapting? Like you talked about the fact that there's no one specific original text. 
As we said, when you hear about this book, you will think maybe, why hasn't this been adapted before? This is super interesting. This is a very rich text. Also, this is a novella. It's not that long. I think it's like 90 something pages. Yeah, it's really short. I mean, if you listen to an audiobook, it's like three, like and a half three hours. hours, four hours. Yeah, it's really short. Because it has so many different themes in it and there's so much inner monologue going on with the main character or one of the main characters, you do wonder why hasn't this been adapted before? Mm. And the truth of the matter is it's a story about black women. Mm -hmm. We were reading up about this movie, how what that was being made, because I remember sort of hearing that this movie was being made and then Tessa Thompson being part of it and Ruth Nega, but I didn't know that Rebecca Hall was the one directing it. And as it turns out, this was in the making for a good decade. Apparently really? Rebecca Hall wrote this like a decade ago. No, what? Yeah. Okay, I'm actually I'm not that surprised. I, I'm 10 years, but also that does make sense because it is Hollywood does not want to put, or not even, this is Hollywood, I don't know. I don't know how movie studios work. So the idea is when you make a movie, you always need financing to make the film. And then you hope that all of this money that was invested then mm -hmm. gets picked up by someone. In this case, I think Netflix paid 6 million for it and they made it for 10. So they hope that way to still make money at the box mm -hmm. office because this was also released in theaters. All the deals they get for essentially renting it out, um, mm -hmm. that that way they make their money back. This movie was not expensive to make. Again, 10 million sounds like it is a shit ton of money, <laughs> but <laughs> in any case, but for movie making, this is nothing. And we talked about this. Did we, or didn't we? Yes, we did. With yesterday, we talked about this, how there's much more a tent pole filmmaking thing going on right now, where they yeah. would rather spend so much more money on a huge Marvel movie rather than putting 10 million into a movie that they don't know that whether that's going to do well because they just assume that Marvel movies are going to do phenomenally. And getting this financed was not easy, even though Tessa Thompson and Ruth Nega were, what's the word, attached to this really mm. early on. Tessa Thompson was also a producer. Um, wait, no, Ruth was also. Yeah, they were both producers, both executive yeah. producers. Is that normal for a film to have the actors be producers on it? I mean, if they really believe in the project and need to get it financed, I guess... It mm. maybe is more of a convincing argument when you, like, as an actor, not just saying, no, I believe in this and I will do this, but actually say, I will put up money with a production mm. company and stuff to get this financed. And originally, I don't know why this makes me love, love uh, uh, laugh, sorry, English. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I read about it, but Benedict Cumberbatch was originally meant to play Hugh. And I mean, yes, this is also because <laughs> I'd already seen this movie at this point. Mm. I, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. No, I don't know how you feel. Oh, that would have just been a bit like I would just not have been able to take it serious. I mean, I think <laughs> even with Thompson, actually, no, to be fair with Thompson, even though I know her as Valkyrie, I've seen her in uh, Do White People, lots of different things. Right. I can kind of still take myself out of it and kind of see her as an actress, kind of playing a role. Whereas with Benedict Cumberbatch, whenever I see him in anything, it's just, it's Benedict Cumberbatch. And usually, <laughs> unless it's something, also, he always seems to play the same character and it's if you play something slightly different, then it's, oh, actually, no, you're doing something different. I'm not constantly thinking about the fact that you're Benedict Cumberbatch. But yeah, that would have been very, that would have just taken me right out of the film. I would have been quite angry if they'd done that. No offense, Benedict. I thought Bill Camp was amazing in this. Yes! He was so yes! good. And the scene in the dance hall where they talk to each other, there's just such a weird power dynamic going on between the mm. two of them. And I think because Tessa Thompson... That's an interesting thing what you said about Benedict Cumberbatch, because that does um, paint your understanding of a movie when you watch something. When you just watch an actor like act, I never had that experience with Thompson. She's just such a good actress that I just always take that as the character. Yeah. As opposed to, this is Tessa Thompson doing like thing. I think with Benedict Cumberbatch, I see Benedict Cumberbatch acting. Yes. As opposed always. to a character. Yeah. I mean, again, that's my perception and that, you know, he's doing well enough, I think. Yeah, he can take two people chatting about, like, chatting a bit of shit on him in a podcast, <laughs> so he's probably, unless he, we tag him and he listens to it, should we tag Ben Dick Cumberbatch? It's no. film he wasn't even in. Please no. <laughs> <laughs> Again, because we were talking about getting this financed, it was pretty hard for them to find anyone who'd finance the whole thing, because they'd already had a lot of the money lined up, but they still needed money, and then Benedict Cumberbatch couldn't do it. And then because of scheduling. And so this poll they needed, again, a white dude, a white straight dude mm. is what they needed, who's already famous and established. And again, neither Tessa Thompson nor, nor Ruth Nigger are 
unknown. No. Like both of these people are famous. And Tessa Thompson's been in Marvel movies. I've only seen Thor Ragnarok. But <laughs> that was a brilliant film. <laughs> But um, I've seen her in many other things. She's such a great actress and established and has been doing this for a while. It's so wild to me that they couldn't get this movie financed. Also, Rebecca Hall is famous. She is a first-time director here, which is super impressive. But mm -hmm. she's been acting also for a long-ass time. You would think this would be easier to finance. But again, a, a movie about a story between the main thing is about Black women it's really mm. hard at the end, like almost to the day, they were still short like half a million dollars Wow! for a 23 day shoot. And it was really hard for them to figure out how to get money. And in the article that I read in Vulture, they talked about how Tessa Thompson, because she knows how the business works was, should I just give Chris Hemsworth a call? So he does the, the role um, of Hugh and wow. they were saying that that wasn't necessarily a bad idea but they were scared that people would think it was stunt casting because yeah. of Marvel yeah yeah and I just think it's really shit because given that this this is the kind of movie that a lot of studios will sell as see we hire diverse people mm. you know <laughs> this will be like press they will give out for this kind mm. of stuff but they will not finance this and mm. that made me really angry <laughs> because it's such a good, I don't know, everybody who talked about this movie said, oh, the script was just so great. I was blown away. And everybody yeah. who watches this movie is Ruth Negger is amazing. Tessa Thompson is amazing. And it makes me really angry that given how, again, I, I know a lot of money, but not in filmmaking terms, how they had such a hard time getting this made. And just, I remember so many companies during the Black Lives Matter protest last year being like, we're gonna invest, we're not just gonna, it's not gonna be all talk, we're gonna put up money for stuff. And you're like, yeah, right. Um, sure. And again, this is not them spending money on a charity. This is their business. And they're yeah. not even willing to invest in good work by good people because it's not about, you know, white men. Mm -hmm. uh, so rant over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also find it funny that they thought that Benedict Cumberbatch, despite the fact that he's Doctor Strange, wouldn't be considered stunt casting next to yeah. Tessa Thompson. I mean, I don't. Do they ever cross paths? I'm not sure. I don't. I'm not sure. So. I don't think so. No, but still. <sighs> but this was very much a passion project for from for everybody from the beginning, and everybody wanted to be attached to this, but no one wanted to pay for it. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to uh, move on to talking about kind of the concept of passing. Passing is a theme and motif um, within the film and the novel. Did you notice, Anna, that in the first, the opening kind of shot of the film, you get like, so the cameras all blurred, and then as it becomes less blurred, you see a shot of people's feet passing yes. by on the oh. on the sidewalk. And then nice. as, <laughs> as Irene walks along, she looks across the street, and what does she see? She sees a man passed out from the heat. Jesus. So many levels. Like, so many like, layers. Yes, this is not how you read films, but like, <laughs> this is what my brain is at. <laughs> Listen, yeah. there's so much in this film. It's a very rich text. No, I'm not kidding. Yes, but very like, rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely what they were going for. Should we do a quick definition of what passing is, just in case anyone is unsure? Yeah. When you meet a person, when you see a person, based on the perception that you've been raised with in terms of education, movies, your religion, your perception of gender, race, ethnicity, all these different things, the way someone talks, sounds, whatever, or moves, you will make assumptions about who they are, where they're from, all sorts of things. And passing is a way to either go along with someone else's perception of you, even if it's untrue, for your benefit, mm -hmm. or maybe just for your safety, frankly. And there's different layers to this. So it's not just, I mean, not only, that sounds like it's nothing, but like mm -hmm. it, this doesn't only pertain to race, but this also pertains to sexuality, gender, all different things. Yeah, so in the book slash film, we have the central concept of passing is some of the characters passing for white um, in kind of white spaces. Um, safety and privileges that might afford them. Um, but in other contexts, you have pa um, straight being straight passing, or like the concept is like straight passing and being yeah. kind of like you can't detect someone's queerness by looking at them and they'll like come across as straight. Or in terms of the gender and like passing as a certain gender again with like big scare quotes around it. Um, but that's sort of like where you might come across that term in terms of like 
perceiving or somebody perceiving you or you perceiving someone in a certain way that maybe does not correlate to sort of what they what someone is again in in scare quotes because yeah. there's the question of how much is their like natural identity i guess if that makes yeah. sense yeah. so it, or like a example, fixed identity it, yeah or a singular identity yeah so a gay man for example on the phone might make his voice more deep so mm. they get taken more seriously because we live in a white supremacist patriarchy which just affords certain amount of mm -hmm. respect for men a lot of this is also about tone policing. You learn what is considered normal or good or valued in society and you sort of go along with it or you just use it for your benefit in certain situations. For a trans person, for example, passing is oftentimes a question of whether they have any kind of safety in any social situation mm -hmm. at all. The difference in terms of the danger in different situations for different people, in terms of race, in terms of this huge intersectionality about this. Oh, yes. It's black. Yeah trans woman is a lot is uh, her life is a lot harder if she doesn't pass quote unquote then you know for me if i'm not perceived as you know cishet or something it's a very different reality it's very complex and yes um i think it comes across in the novel as well because and in the film because in the narrative it's not just racial passing that you see but also that concept is expanded further to talk about infidelity and the idea of passing off a marriage as the perception of it as like a happy marriage and then like what's going on beneath the surface and also like themes of like repressed homosexuality which we'll get into later all these things are sort of like floating about in the novel and then get pulled out i think a bit more in the film which yes. is really interesting yeah there's a lot about performance there's a lot about performing to what you think someone else will assume of you in order for them to respect you as a person mm. kind of two at least two parties involved and a lot of context yeah. So I think we're going to move now into talking about the theme of subfuge, things not being as they seem. And I just wanted to give a quote from the text, uh, which I think is Irene. I can't remember when this is in the novel. Um, she says, appearances she knew now had a way sometimes of not fitting facts, which I think summarizes that whole thing about passing in like the whole novel, what it's interested in unpacking and exploring. And Anna, you mentioned to me when we were kind of putting together the script, the book was written, you kind of like flagged that the book was written and taking place during prohibition throughout the film you see claire with a little bottle of I don't know, some sort of spirit there's already that feeling of the context of hiding something and trying not to be perceived yes. in a certain way because there's a danger in being perceived and underlying subterfuge that is the setting which i think again i'm not sure that was particularly there in the book i feel like they did mention flasks and things but it's very kind of like present in the film you can really get that sort of speakeasy vibe I think that's something that they did in the movie really well because they put it in there that Claire giggles a lot in the scene where they're at the in the hotel room uh, when she pulls out the flask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't pick up on that until the second view. Oh, because of prohibition. Um, yeah. Oh, I didn't get that. Oh. Yeah. Rebecca Hall like really gave you this as a layer of people doing something very much in public, something that everybody does or that certain yeah. people will have more severe consequences if they're found out. But it's never explicitly stated which i think why it's done so well that's so good yeah that's so good and also okay because the film is like a film rather than the like because in the book you get it from irene's perspective so it's all internal monologue everything that you're seeing you kind of know is from irene's perspective whereas in the film because it's a film and it's that kind of more omnipotent sort of medium you get the sense that you're seeing just reality and objective reality and that's kind of what watching a film does. Good. I think it's also interesting in terms of what you said about adaptation theory here, because this did not occur to me until you just said it, but a person writing a book in 1920s would not think to talk about prohibition in a way that we talk about it now as, oh, oh remember when America banned alcohol? The reason yeah, she didn't talk about it explicitly is because this was just the life for everybody, you know? Because it was just happening now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so interesting. I actually wonder, because like, obviously if we are, sorry, yeah, living through a pandemic. Yeah. The idea, that idea of like, I don't know, does that just feel like normal? And do you think that's just going to like move into everyday kind of discussion? Like prohibition, it's just like, I won't even think to mention this because that's just like the way things are. Because I feel like it still kind of feels like it's sort of weird and a bit unknown and sort of like a, a new thing. But I think I because know. of postmodernism, I mm. think we're just so much more self-aware and self-reflecting all of the time. And yeah, I've we're just so aware. We're just so <laughs> self-aware. <laughs> <laughs> like, not even necessarily in a good way. Because during the pandemic, I saw a lot on Twitter of people being like, I don't ever want to see a face mask in 
a movie or a television show, stop it. I don't want to think about the mm, pandemic while yeah. I'm watching television. And at the same time, at least in the beginning of the pandemic, not even in modern, mo like modern contemporary <laughs> movies, but old movies, every time someone stood close to someone. Yeah. I was like, can you just get, <laughs> just, yeah, sit back, sit back, two meters, please. <laughs> or someone would leave a, a building, their own apartment, and then would just go about their day. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> Put on a mask. How dare you go outside? <laughs> yeah. I was watching Insecure, which I know was made like the last, the final season was made during the pandemic. And I told you about this, but they had hospital scenes, but they didn't acknowledge the pandemic at all. Ooh. I think they had so many scenes where people were sitting close to each other in a hospital and it just was so unnerving to me where I was like, just put on a freaking mask. But again, movie makers and filmmakers and I mean, yes, also literature has to think about, are people going to be annoyed when they're going to be reminded of this time mm. <laughs> because of the inconvenience or are going to be saddened by thinking about, because there's a difference in not being able to drink alcohol and a deadly disease being out there. You know mm, what I mean? It's true. I guess once there's sort of like a more subtle influence on your everyday life and it'll influence you more in certain situations, whereas like with COVID, it has a much more widespread and kind of overarching yeah, influence on your life. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense actually that one would have a very different impact on media to the other. Um, right. And they'd, yeah, they do that in different ways. But again, I don't, I do think that a lot of people in the 1920s were thinking about this. I do not think that they were, I don't know, I guess they were more busy or something. Yeah, but they like, were just getting on with their lives. Again, this was the Jim Crow yes. era. Like I'm not, mm, yeah. There were bigger issues than the prohibition of alcohol. <laughs> yeah, very true. Again, um, I'm saying sorry. this is a Bavarian yeah. person. Alcohol is important. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> jumping back to book versus film yes. so again irene's like in the book you have her internal monologue whereas in the film the kind of way to so if through that internal monologue you kind of see the world from her perspective in the in the film um i think they do a really interesting job of sort of showing that perception and change in perception kind of through the use of different techniques with the camera which makes it so you're more aware I think of the fact that you're seeing someone's perceptions rather than like an objective reality um all the mirrors for example yes exactly the mirrors um so like there's that really good shot which like both of us picked up on I think in our notes <laughs> of like when I think Claire's just started visiting them and they're gonna go I think they're gonna go to the um dance hall dance hall that's it um, and Claire, uh, sorry, Irene comes down the stairs and Claire and Brian are sort of chatting with each other and you see the mirror yes. shot of them and they look really close to each other. And you're yeah. like, oh, interesting. And then it pans to where they actually are and they're stood like miles apart, like two meters, yeah. it's COVID times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, and it's very obvious, but also you're like, yes. And no, it's just very exciting to see. Is it the creeping doubts of Irene? Is it sort of like just foreshadowing is it sort of showing you something like the internal kind of feelings of those characters or of Irene seeing those characters it's really it's sort of like quite ambiguous and really interesting yeah in a novel or in a book you just have so much more you can have the inner monologue and you just in a movie do you use narration does that mm -hmm. make it too much and if you are not using this, which Rebecca, Rebecca Hall didn't hear. No, I'm so glad to, she doesn't. Yes. Yeah. You need to show somehow this doubt starting to creep in. And like, where does yeah. it start? Does it start with Claire? Did it start before? How much do we trust? Um, wait, did I say Irene or Claire? <laughs> I was going to say, do we trust Irene? Sorry, Irene. Yeah, do we like trust her perspective? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I'm really glad that Rebecca Hall doesn't, you didn't use narration because it's sort of one of my pet I'm not sure if I've spoken about this before, but I really, really hate it when they use narration. Like it can be done well, mm. but I think usually, especially when it's like adapting book to film, it's quite a lazy way of showing a character's perspective and telling you something about the scene. It's just like, I'm going to tell you this by telling you. Whereas in passing, they tell you it through by show, it's show don't tell which yeah is just, it's just good gonna, storytelling I was, I was gonna say lily would you refer to this as show don't <laughs> tell <laughs> yes anna yes i would um, <laughs> um but yeah i think it's it's just it's just good it's just better but it does have some interesting effects in terms of inter again it makes it more open to interpretation which i appreciate and which we're going to talk a bit more about but yeah. i first want to talk to pull out the fact that they also choose or record hall chooses to shoot in black and white as well yes. uh do you want to um, pick up on that because you made an interesting note 
<laughs> I said, I want to <laughs> argue about this. That's Lily's really yeah. way of saying yes. you made an interesting note. <laughs> no, because, <laughs> no, because you wrote down that it, you wrote down that black and white is like are already unreliable and blurred. Mm. Yes. And I think that's interesting because one of the, again, this is more of a pet peeve in terms of technology, but like a lot of modern, and they don't just do this in movies anymore. They also do this on TV now where everything is sort of this weird brown sludge. Mm. I don't know what to call it, but like colors aren't pronounced anymore. Like, and I didn't understand this until recently that it's not just like the reduction of color. It's the fact that they don't have the the contrast. That's contrast. Really, yes, you don't, just don't have the contrast anymore. And I think it's interesting that I watched this entire movie. Just kept thinking, how is this movie in black and white and so dark? And I can still tell better where something is or where someone's face is. Yes. Unlike most television shows, like people yelled just... about this a lot in Game of Thrones, for example. Like they were like, yes, the night scene, the like that bloody yeah, the <sighs> oh, like the thing. I need contrast. What was it, the, the, Unlike not Helm's Deep, but like Winterfell, the like battle at Winterfell. Winterfell. And when it was just like my parents watched us on like the laptop and they were like, we could not see anything. Yeah. You turned the, like the brightness up right to the top. We could not see yeah. a thing. That's just bad lighting. I think. Yeah, it is. It's just bad lighting. It, this film is not interesting. So well, yeah. It doesn't make anything more interesting. It doesn't no. make you. It doesn't. And also, it, like, yeah. don't tell me that that's because the world is getting darker. Like, fuck that. <laughs> you can't see it. So it's just bad. Also, I know it's cheaper, but also you have a lot of money at this stage. So, like, yeah. Yeah. Angry with you, Game of Thrones. L I may be the first one to say this, but I didn't really like the last season of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so proud of you for being brave Thank enough. Thank you. Hot to take. Be first person. Just, yeah. <laughs> No, but this isn't even about the plot of it. But if I cannot see what's happening in a scene, I need contrast enough to be able to tell where someone's face ends, where someone else's begins. And this movie, when you said un unreliable and blurry, that was good point. Also, <laughs> <laughs> it was very, still very much contrasted, despite the mm. fact that it's in monochrome. Because yeah. Rick Beckham Hall talked about this. The the irony of using black and white will show you it's not black and white. It's a thousand shades of gray is what she said. But yeah. it's you can tell what's happening in scenes, even though uh, the Redfield's house is quite dark, right? Mm. There's a lot more darkness inside of this house, which again, I'm assuming is a metaphor. I just love the fact that Rebecca Hall knew how to use black and white here in a way which enriched the story and showed you something that you didn't need to be told through narration mm -hmm. and managed to be a good metaphor for what passing is about. But also, thank God, the woman didn't turn down the contrast and no. I could still <laughs> see everything. That was really yeah. nice. Thank you. <laughs> I think in this film, especially, like, it's like she had a very, like, hyper awareness of, like, the kind of, like, light and shadow and sort of, like, what was happening with the contrast. Yes. Because so much of it is sort of, like, how you perceive the characters in different situations and sort of, like, how the kind of light around them sort of changes how you see them. Like, because a lot of it is, like, do you, like are these the characters within this story perceiving these characters as black or white and so like when you're watching it it's sort of like how do you perceive that like you're kind of very hyper aware um which is another thing I wanted to talk about actually um which is linking back to our Bob's Burgers episode um Ooh. and kind of like because they went for that like um black and white and it's a bit artsy um it's kind of got that slight distancing effect like there's a kind of slight theatricality about it um, the, or I think anyway, that kind of keeps you aware of what you're watching. It's a good point yeah. because you don't, it's not just another television episode that's running in the background. You just want to pay attention mm -hmm. because you have less, that's a weird thing to say, but because you don't have the color, you have less to focus on. So it sort of draws you in on paying more attention to what actually is shown to you. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I agree. And and also, like, there's a kind of sense that it's aware of itself. And so it's aware of its your perceptions of it, and you're aware that you're, it's aware of your perceptions of it. And there's a kind of bit of back and forth that makes you kind of more hyper aware of how you're, like, interpreting these characters. Like, you are kind of constantly aware that you're, you're watching something and you're interpreting it. And that's the key theme of interpretation that we keep coming back to. You didn't have that many sets um, which I'm mm. assuming was also because of the production costs, but yeah, because of that, you said it was very theatrically, but I thought that also made it feel like I was watching like a play yeah. being played out on like very few stages because you just have the bedroom, the mm. ground floor and the dance hall. Like you have, you don't have that many like, different, you know what I mean? Like, like you're not walking through yeah. the park. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
definitely. It's always nice on filmmakers use the potential that a tool has for their piece of art. But there were also mm -hmm. these shots that were through the hallway. Like yes, I wanted point. to bring that up. Yes. yes, sorry, you go, you go, you go. And when it focused on Brian, the perception of the camera, what it tells us, whose gaze are we watching here? Mm. Because it would zoom in on Brian's face, looking at his wife. Is he looking for a reaction? Because they just said goodbye to Claire. Is he yeah. worried about his wife because she seems to be so sort of forlorn somehow and sad? What is what is going on with her? You're not even standing next to either one of these people and you're not getting their gaze. Yeah. You're an onlooker on this scene. Yeah. And I think that idea of the gaze is really important as well. Like that is so much of like passing as well. It's like whose gaze is looking at people and kind of like, what is that gaze picking up? And you're sort of aware of yourself as an audience member, like gazing, but also like whose gaze am I picking up? Like you said, and kind of like what interpretation am I being shown by the camera? So you have like a lot of kind of like Irene, like in that opening scene when she's in the cafe, you see Irene looking up from under her hat at like all the other people in that cafe, gazing at them. And then Claire returns that gaze and yeah. that's quite shocking and it's quite unnerving. Um, and sort of like her fear is that she's been like clocked. She's been like, yeah. um, that like she realizes that she's black and it's that kind of like fear of discovery. And one more point I wanted to make yeah. was that there's an interesting kind of blur between the real and the unreal as well. You're aware that you're watching something um, because there's that trumpet that sort of when you're fir you first hear it, sort of just sort of like playing kind of a tune and I'm going to mess this up. Um, and it, you kind of interpret it as di diegetic or non-diegetic when it's just like in the in part of the score, you interpret it as part of the score and I've forgotten which is which, which is bad because we did this in the Bob's Burgers episode. I think diegetic means it's in the film. Like the characters know what's going on. Yeah. I know what you mean though. Why can I not remember this? We talked about this at length. <laughs> it's confusing because it's just the same word, but with non in the in the beginning. And it's like, what does diegetic, like, it's a Greek term and I can't remember what it means. Diegetic so. music in a film or TV is part of the action. It can be heard by the characters, ah, yeah. Okay. So, so diegetic you it's, is in the story. In, so you presume the trumpet is non-diegetic. Um, because it sort of like kind of plays along with the score exactly and then you hear like somebody being like shut up or something or like knocking banging on the wall and then like <laughs> the <laughs> and you realize the trumpet is part of, is diegetic yeah. it's part of the thing and you're like oh you're aware of the form and the character and it's sort of like there's a blur between the form and the like actual content as well I want to bring it back to there's that scene where Claire sorry Irene is alone in the house and sort of she's kind of framed by these two doors and it's like so like the rate aspect ratio is kind of like it's for three it's for three but then with these doors it's sort of made even closer so it kind yeah. of you feel that kind of claustrophobia that because because it's in black and white again as well it's sort of like it becomes even the screen becomes even smaller and that's kind of part of just like the di the diegetic and diegetic blur into each other and so it's interesting and it's and it becomes kind of part of itself the frame is already constricting your view and then you say the doors are even more like constricting Irene. Yeah and again to kind of link back to adaptation theory it's the, the genre slash medium brings out that theme of, of interpretation and yeah and like perception even more like because it's you blur between the two between diegetic and non-diegetic. You said the thing about the trumpet also being I think you wrote this down that the trumpet is also used as a metaphor for madness in a lot of yes. stories. In Streetcar Named Desire, which yeah. I studied at GCSE or A level, <laughs> A level, to throw my brain back like three years or so. Um, but like, yeah, so like kind of the trumpet is this kind of trope of madness and also kind of like sadness, obviously, like with the blues, but also kind of like madness that you have the character Blanche in Streetcar, which is again the kind of a theme that's kind of with Irene and with her like, um, you see her kind of getting very paranoid and kind of like her kind of like descent into kind of like a feverishness, which kind of links to the idea of like the dress the jazz trumpet or blues trumpet. Again, we talked about how Netflix didn't really push this movie on me, although, even though this is the, exactly the kind of movie I would want to watch. Mm, yeah. Um, because Netflix did set up like a promotion website for this film, like Ooh. for awards consideration. And because I only found this 24 hours ago, I didn't really think to put, because we already like cut this down so much because <laughs> we have so much to say about this film. So much to say. But when you open the website and you go through the booklet for the awards consideration, there's a trumpet playing the entire time. 
<laughs> and it's you know remember it, like those old websites when you like, open someone's website and it just blurred music at you and you were like ah, ah <laughs> yes I remember that oh good old early 2010s oh good times and I just the entire time I was like is this meant to make me mad <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because um it's Devonte uh Hines but I just thought it was funny that Netflix produced this entire website where you can read listen experience this movie <laughs> <laughs> and they don't put it out anywhere. I found this because I was like, scrolling through Tumblr and someone posted it. But again, this is another looks... very interesting bit of adaptation just there. The film yeah. into like a website experience, an interactive <laughs> website experience. Yeah, which I looked at on my at like midnight <laughs> because I randomly <laughs> found it on Tumblr. Because the, the score is beautiful and it's beautifully mm. composed and it's beautifully used. The movie is quite, again, I'm assuming also this is because of production costs, but the movie is quite silent, but mm. not in a way yes. where you ever bored or think, why is no one speaking or why isn't there a score here? I think it's really amazing that they, again, it's similar to the color where they reduced it down and yeah. when the music flares up, like you said, when the music plays, you are picking it up as something that's telling you something. Yeah, it's like absence is presence as well. It's like, yes, it's also all of the film is so deliberate. It's like with the lighting, with the sound, it's so deliberate. Rebecca Hall like knows what she's doing with each of these elements and is like doing something with every single part of it. That's why this film is really, really good. It's very intentional. <laughs> mm. When I first watched this movie, I thought, oh, interesting, I'm going to read this book. And then when I watched the movie again, I picked up on like five different more things, mm. every single scene, and I was like, oh, this is a great film. I know, it like, reading the book really changes, like, it does really enrich the experience of watching it, which is, I kind of love how ambiguous it is, and that you can kind of get a very different reading from it, from having not read the book. But then when you do read the book, it's sort of like, you get a completely different experience, and so it's so much of it is sort of like you're interpreting those characters and their thoughts in different ways. So because I read the book first, I was like very convinced that Claire and Brian were having an affair because Irene in the book is so convinced they're having an affair. And I sort of didn't really, even though it's like, obviously it's from her perspective, she was just so kind of clear on it and so explicit with it that I was just like, yeah. And when I watched the film, I was like, well, clearly. And then Anna, when you watched it, you didn't think, I re-listened to the voice note you sent me and you were like, there's... <laughs> Like, I don't know why Irene was so angry. There's like, you know, Claire wasn't a threat to her husband or anything. And I was like, what? Like, that was your interpretation? <laughs> like, what? But then on my second viewing, I was like, no, actually. Like, because I was more aware of it as like perception and interpretation. I was like, oh no, I don't like, this doesn't like, obviously Irene is having, is being really paranoid and like, this probably isn't happening. The first time I watched it, I just thought, I mean, this is so easy to say because I'm not saying that I'm better at this in real life, but just watching a couple not communicate always drives me up a wall because there's so many <laughs> scenes where Brian just again about the gays just looks at her. There's the scene where she's sitting in front of the uh, Christmas tree and he's just saying like, good evening or something. And I was like, just talk to her. Just to speak, speak. <laughs> you see it's that like this woman is like struggling with something. Yeah, it's like, we can't hear what you're thinking. We're interpreting in random ways. Like, just have a chat. Like, talk it through, please. Yeah. Again, it's always easy <laughs> to judge this from the outside. <laughs> also, I've not been married with two kids. I have no idea what that's like. But, true. Me but neither. I will say also again about the camera giving you the gaze. Is it Irene's perception of everything? Because in the beginning of the movie, mm. there's a lot of talk about how her husband is always tired and he's constantly yawning because he's so exhausted from his job, right? Yeah. And that goes away over the course of the film. You don't Claire's see him. there. Oh, okay. We'll talk more say, about this later. <laughs> I was going to say I thought it was because she doesn't just notice it as much anymore because she's so convinced maybe. something else is going on. Oh, maybe. Or maybe she's more interested in Claire. Like that whole, like, Claire is taking oh. up so much of her, like, brain that she's just not focusing <gasps> on Brian as much and sort of, like, being as, as, like, worried about... Although she is still very paranoid about him wanting to move abroad. So it's sort of, like, I feel like there's just more, like, Claire brings that energy when she's there and then when she's not there's no energy good point okay. so because i'm german i just wanted to bring this in the movie and the book not the movie necessarily i don't think the book mm -hmm. in german was translated as seitenwechsel which means changing sides or switching sides i mean this is yes. a, a longer conversation german <laughs> book titles become more exoticized it's really horrible. Like, 
a lot of Asian authors have noted this, especially East Asian ones that have talked about, you know, the English uh, book had like a cover that was well designed or something. And then the German cover had a lotus flower on it, even though nothing in this book has mm. anything to do with lotus flowers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just an example, Trevor Noah, the host of The Daily Show, wrote a book, Born a Crime, because when he was born, he was born to a white father and a black mother, apartheid, uh, South uh, Africa. So he was literally, yeah. his existence was a crime. The German title for this book in German is Colorblind, <sighs> which one, makes no sense. Two, that's literally that's, something no, that no one should... No. <laughs> that's the opposite of what the title's saying as well because it's like it's so relevant like it's like no it's not colorblind because it's literally a crime because like of apartheid like race is really important yeah so it's like yeah. the opposite yeah. it's complete it's, no <laughs> pretending to be colorblind is a white person's privilege mm. of pretending to not be to be able to be above it all but that's yeah. not possible in a white supremacist society. Exactly. It's a way of sort person. of like not having, yeah, it's a way of like not having to like think about it by being like, oh, I'm colorblind. So it's sort of like, so I don't have to like, yeah, um, in like investigate my own racism. There would be no need for passing in a colorblind society, but that's not the case. We don't live in <laughs> no. one. Well, so it's completely, it's a completely ignoring of people's actual identities and experiences. So, you know, I just wanted to bring that in. <laughs> so the reason we're talking about this is because in terms of passing, who here really has the agency? Yes. Um, and with, because with like changing sites, I'm going to, site and vexel, is that right? Yeah. So when you first brought this up to me, you were like, it's interesting they use this term because it places so much like agency in the person doing the passing. It's like they kind of like deliberately and like maliciously switching sides. It's like yeah. a choice. Whereas you were like, that doesn't kind of make sense to, or make as much sense as passing where there's that kind of like, that blur between active and passive it's more kind of like you're not especially in the book for example like Irene most of the time she says like she doesn't like kind of actively try to pass like she's just sort of like you know for convenience she'll like go into a shop um and so she'll kind of like use in quotation marks like um her like ability to pass to like you know not be discriminated against to like go, um like go in a taxi to like go to like a cafe or whatever not die of heat but stroke it's, yeah not die of heat stroke and it's just like for convenience sake um whereas like only once did she actually like kind of in in a sense like actively try to like pass the white woman like mm -hmm. it was her like kind of main intention which is with um claire's husband jo john jack yes. john 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 yeah like the ambiguity of like agency in passing is it in the person doing the passing or is it kind of like more in the person perceiving or like perceiving them as passing it's yeah. always the person with privilege to whom you need to be who you need to pass for irene in a group of black people doesn't need to pass as anything in terms mm. of her race right yeah she just needs to be herself but you just need to pass for the person with the privilege the person who could prevent you from entering certain spaces or be safe in them mm. right just think yeah. it's interesting in terms of Seitenwechsel because I was thinking about this in terms of because it just sounds much more deliberate. A person is, like you said, making a choice. The idea of Seitenwechsel, especially in sports, because that's where I've mostly heard it, everybody's aware of the rules. Ooh. Like yeah. in past, everybody's sort of, I mean, that's again the idea of colorblindness. If you're calling the Seitenwechsel, then you're saying that everybody's aware of the rules. Black people are aware of these rules. Black mm. pe uh, white people just have the privilege of not having to be aware. Because yeah, and they, they talk to go anywhere. Yeah, exactly, and it's sort of like talked about in the text. Uh, so it's when um, Irene talks about um, with Hugh. Is that right? Hugh, yes. the yeah, the, <laughs> the writer. I'm um, kind of that. Um, it might be easy for um, like a black person to pass as white, but harder for a white person to pass as black. Yeah, because it's sort of like white people wouldn't presume that. Oh, I can't quite remember now, but it's sort of like there's that idea of that idea of that privilege of sort of like you don't have to think about it as much, and you're not kind of like aware of these aware of these rules and quotation marks. Yeah. Um. Whereas, like, if you're black, you're kind of like more hyper aware because it's like a lot more about your safety and you're in danger. Um. And also the idea that like there are any set rules within passing. It's so like again, it's very blurred and it's very sort of like complex and it's yeah and like it's very context dependent and very person dependent as well. Okay, also I wanted to bring in the idea of if there's like any sort of agency in identity, which I think the film kind of asks like questions you about as well, again with those mirror shots. So there's like that one scene kind of towards the end when Irene's kind of getting really, really paranoid. I think it's just before they go to the party where Claire 
falls out of the window. Um, yeah. But you have that shot of her, of Irene looking in a mirror and the kind of like many, many reflections. There's like a mirror behind her and you know that effect when there's like two mirrors and you just kind of have like, like a lot of reflections of into infinity. Yeah, exactly. Infinite Irene's. She's like losing that sense of her stable self, which again, we'll talk a bit more about later questioning the idea if you have like any sort of agency and identity or if it's all kind of very context dependent yeah. and relating to other people as well yeah i thought the scene where paranoia gets worse you hear her breath you just hear it louder and louder yeah yeah and i um, think again that's with the silence of the film as well it's like if you start hearing little details like that like even just someone's breath and you, you know that something's gonna come and which is again why it's such a good film yeah I think yeah. in terms of agency, the reason I found this so interesting is because Claire from the book in the movie, I mean, in the book, there's more information about Claire's family, the bad situation she was in because her father was, I don't know if it's explicitly stated, but he was drinking and like he was yeah. not reliable. I think it's implied yeah. or, or maybe shown that he's abusive because like, I think there's that part of the beginning where she wanted, she didn't give him his her money from like a job or something because she wanted to buy a dress. Mm -hmm. um and then he like there's certainly like emotional abuse happening and verbal yeah. abuse yeah because we identify both of these women with a certain side if that's what we're calling it i mean none of this is like a strict binary right because we are defining these by marriages there's like mm -hmm. the agency here isn't really full for both of these women because yeah. they sort of both picking a side quote unquote because of their husbands and that's even how they talk about passing in the beginning the way that claire finds out that irene has not been passing but i think yeah. even for claire i just thought it was so weird to attribute this idea to her that she had agencies because when she was taken out of her uh, situation with her father she was then uh, placed with white family members and that's also how she met her husband so there must have been like, a moment where she could have stated that she wasn't white right but for mm -hmm. the most i just assume that it wasn't really her choice in that moment again this is about who gets to make the decision whether you're passing or not yeah someone white looked at her and made a, an assumption mm. and she just never I, corrected it yeah and it's that kind of look because i think in the book um when claire talks about it she's like you know this this person came in didn't have any idea of my background you kind of get that sort of at least from irene it's sort of like you know she took that opportunity and she like took it because you know her like aunts were very you know made her like do all the cleaning like treated her as like kind of subhuman really mm -hmm. devalued her and so she was like you know this is my escape through passing it's that sort of like lying through a mission um and sort of like again we're not like passing any judgment here yeah it's sort of like there's a sort of active and a passive element and a kind of like a blurring between the two, which makes it kind of very difficult to see where the agency is in that situation. And especially it's like if you're kind of pushed to go into that situation because of, because, well, partly like because of her safety, but also also just because, you know, she wanted more from life than being a cleaner for her aunts and like kind of yeah. what that life could have offered her. And so looking at the agency and like, um, like kind of seeing the context of those choices, I guess, as well. Yeah. Also, yeah. she was 18 when they got married. That's, yeah. I mean, now that seems, I mean, I do know people still get married at 18, but yeah. like, this was like a hundred, truly a hundred years ago, mm. but still like an 18 year old just making that kind of a decision for herself as an escape out of another situation, which doesn't even mean that she didn't like her husband at the time, you know, it's just everything you said, the idea of she didn't have all the options because of her identity. So to just choose the better option for yourself mm. at the time makes just sense in that moment. But yeah. the idea that she was, I don't know, just, I hate the term side and excellence because I just think that the idea is completely implies, and I'm not saying that there's like a perfect translation of a lot of these terms, but I, th I think it heavily implies the idea that Claire had so much more options to choose from. And yeah. she just was like, well, everybody's aware of the rules. I'm just going to choose this side because I want this one. And you're like, yeah. no, that's, that wasn't quite her situation. <laughs> yeah. It's like, how much freedom is there when there's very yeah. limited options? Like, is that choice? So the reason I wanted to talk about the ending now is because I think that the film, again, we're talking mainly about the film right here, kind of picks up on that idea of the ambiguity and the amb ambiguity of the agency with the final scene of Claire falling out that window. When I, again, because I'd read the book before I'd seen the film, yes. when it got to that ending, I was like, Claire was, ob Irene obviously pushed Claire out the window, obviously, because in the book, 
Irene makes it fe- like it's very it's not explicit but it might as well be like, Irene yeah. is so she sort of talks about how you know she like put her arm on Claire put her hand on Claire and then like how she didn't run down with everyone else and how suspicious that might look and then she's like it kind of like, thought occurs to her like oh god what if Claire's still alive and she's like really panicked about it it's just made very uh, do you do you agree it's quite explicit in the book that Irene's or it's ambiguous, but it's very much implied. Everything you talked about in terms of adaptation theory, you read the book and then watched the movie and you were very clear, oh, she pushed her out the window. Yes. I watched the movie and I thought, oh, she put her arm up because a John was at the door and screaming, my wife is in there. And everybody else at the party is very confused. They're like, why would your wife be here? And he then screams at her and super aggressive, comes across the room and you just see this arm reaching out. And I just assumed that that was just a friend being like, no, you just, you just in that moment. Yeah, a protective of, arm, right? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then I just thought, oh my God, no, no, no. You just want to protect that person. This is the husband coming to beat her up or worse. You just want something to be in between those two people. Mm-hmm. And then when I read the book, I thought, oh, she pushed her out the window. This was so clear to me in the book. But when you watch the movie again... <laughs> Mm. you see so many moments and we're going to talk about like different moments when this is picked up throughout the story when you watch it again because there's three options here either claire jumped somehow irene pushed her or john pushed her i saw that as well Mm. and i thought well john didn't push her because he wasn't near enough and i Mm. thought the reason why i remember at the time when i'd only seen the movie i thought what was possible in my head was that claire because claire is crying but silent She doesn't say anything because there's a glance exchange between Irene and Claire. Before I'd read the book, I thought it's possible the reaching out of the arm wasn't pushing her, but was sort of giving her space to make her own choice and essentially yeah leave her. again because that's the thing whether claire had agency in that final moment or not i think is quite key when again when we were discussing this before and you said that you thought this is before you read the book um and you thought that um claire had jumped out of the window you mentioned the teapot scene earlier in the film yes. where irene is have is throwing a tea party and she can see like for claire you. and for you yes and she can see like claire and brian having a conversation in the corner and I can't quite remember what exactly she hears now, but she hears something and it makes her drop this teapot that she's holding. And then Hugh says something like, oh, sorry, I must have pushed you. Yes. And then and then Irene says, no, you didn't push me. You know, I, I but like this teapot was like from the Confederates and I've been wanting to get rid of it for years. And what she say, um, what's the exact line? Um, she'd been well she'd been trying for years to try and get rid of it and that only just occurred to her that i only had to break it and i would be rid of it forever before this when he says i must have pushed you again this is based on me watching this once before reading the book i thought this was a foreshadowing at what happens where it both look like the end scene will look like irene pushed claire but mm-hmm. it wasn't it was actually a choice and this yeah. is foreshadowed by the scene. But then later, like you point out when she says, I only had to break it and I would be rid of it forever. Cuts to Claire's face. But I think it's interesting because it's like you interpreted the first time around Claire as Irene in that moment. Yeah. Right. And so it was like, you know, Claire has the agency. So if we're reading that as like Claire jumping out the window, it's like Claire yeah. having the agency of like, I'm like, you know, I have the agency in this moment. I'm ending things. Whereas I interpreted Claire as the teapot being kind of dropped or slash pushed by Irene yeah. um, and kind of like, kind of like Irene has the agency in that moment. But then even in the moment, again, there's Hugh saying like, oh, it was me. And Irene saying, no, it wasn't you. It was, um, like, it was me. I, I, I like deliberately dropped it. But yeah. like you get the impression and in the book as well, it's like she drops it. She doesn't mean to. It's all it's an accidental. So even in that, like as she claims agency for it, you're sort of like, aware that it's not completely conscious as well so it's a very ambiguous the agency in that moment is very ambiguous and that carries over into the final ending scene with Claire falling out the window it's sort of like her being brought to like boiling point pun intended Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) because she's watching the two of them across the room and she's picking up certain parts of what Claire is saying and you just see Um, Irene walking around with this teapot and she's holding it tighter and tighter and tighter until she breaks it to be rid of it forever. 
there was also that moment when she rambles on because she needs an argument because she doesn't want to be seen as that lady who were like yeah went so over the top that she broke something she she needs, yeah she needs to keep up that like pretense of yeah. respectability yeah she talks about all this stuff and she just talks this long thing and then hugh says to her well done and it sort of stops uh... her for a second because hugh is calling her out on acting in that moment yeah. he's like well done nice yeah. nice nice cover nice <laughs> catch yeah nice cover like, like he was more aware of the fact that his friend is deteriorating than brian is but he still doesn't say anything he's still like no, no we need to respectably pass and again okay mm -hmm. i'm just gonna mm -hmm. like jump a little bit ahead and talk about kind of like sexuality because i think you read somewhere that like hugh is in, like it's implied that he was gay and that it's sort of like a kind Rebecca of you get, like, said that <laughs> Oh, Rebecca, okay, Rebecca Hall said that. And it's that kind of like needing to pass and keep up appearances for like safety and propriety. Um, and it's like in this moment, that kind of like recognition, again, it's it's a kind of like kind of queer subtext. Oh, well, well done for like keeping your cool in this moment. Well done for like not letting people see like the actual, like the truth of like how you're feeling of like what you are, which again, like kind of really comes through in that moment passing. Yeah. We're all of us passing for something, something, something or other, <sighs> aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so can i just say i know this is a podcast but just when you said he's gay and i know you were just gesturing because you were talking but you went limp wrist I, and i just was like <laughs> yes yes <laughs> it was not intentional but there we yeah, go yeah no but i just love the fact that it wasn't intentional <laughs> nice um <laughs> brian didn't pick up on it as much i'm like why why did why? you not notice yeah or like, also, why didn't you say? Because it's, I think he, I think he does notice. Okay, I'm sorry, again, we're jumping ahead, but I think he does notice. And I think it's sort yeah. of like implied, again, because it's all from Irene's perspective, she kind of picks up everything he's doing is sort of like guilty, guilty, guilty. You're having an affair, guilty. Whereas like when you're kind of like watching it with a slightly more critical eye, you're like, oh no, like Brian is, you know, the reason he stops talking to her is because she all keeps overreacting to everything he's saying in a way. And he's mm. sort of like presented more as the voice of reason. Like when it's, it's an, again, an interesting shift from book to film. In the book, um, when they're, I think they're talking about um, not wanting to talk about like, quote unquote, the race problem with the with boys. Yeah. Um, and Brian says, for someone as intelligent as you like to think you are, mm -hmm. you can be, re you're being really stupid or something like that. Whereas in the film, he says, in the book, for someone yeah. as intelligent as you are, um, you're being really stupid. And so he sort of presented more as a sort of like voice of reason in the film. You can kind of like a bit, a slightly more sympathetic voice of reason than in the book where he kind of comes across as a bit more malicious and you're less likely to kind of sympathize with a him. A lot sort of, less. Uh, oh sympathetic. God, yeah. I, I did yeah. not care for that dude in the book. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. He's horrible. He seems horrible, but again, it's from Irene's perspective. So it's yeah. like very difficult to say. I also think it's interesting that Andre Holland, who you might recognize from Moonlight, who plays the husband, and he said that um, sometimes journalists will come up to him and say, I saw that scene, I know you were up to something. And he said that he didn't think that the husband was up to anything, as far as Claire is concerned. And I sort of agree. Like, I don't yeah. think any of that was really true. The thing about the ambiguous ending and the lack of, the, the like, difficulty of placing agency heightens in a way the tragedy because it's like, did Claire ever have agency in, like, her life? Even in her final moments, kind of, where did that agency lie? And it's sort of like, the truth is that you don't know because it's, it's also ambiguous and it's also, like, relational to other people that you can never quite know where that, like, that agency is. Which is why this why this movie is so interesting because it sort of gives you different it sounds so strange because you're always seeing the same thing but if you watch it multiple times you just pick mm. up on on so many different things like the fact that you see the arm being stretched out is not flat but the hand like the gripping part of the hand is turned towards claire yeah and after yeah. the after claire has fallen to her death you see Irene's um, cross her arms behind her back and like her fingers. Yeah, there's like of... close ups on her hands. Yeah. 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 And I, it's didn't sort know, of like... I didn't notice that the first time <laughs> round. But... And I, yeah, and I think it's like, in a way, it's sort of like signal. It could be signaling, oh, she pushed her like it, red handed guilty. Yeah. But like, when I, again, when I watch it with my parents, they, I think what they interpreted from the film was that John pushed Claire. And so they got like a completely <laughs> different, I know, but it's so interesting. It and that, like, they were like, again, cause they sort of work a bit in filmmaking. They were like, cause I was like, no, she, Irene obviously pushed Claire. And they were like, well, the film didn't make that obvious enough. 
because you didn't like even though you did see that kind of hand you didn't get like enough it didn't signal it, it didn't cue it enough for it to be like a really obvious thing and we were sort of debating how like we, I was kind of like I was like oh is, does that mean the film's bad but I think it was very intentional like we've been discussing it's very intentional that it's very unclear what happened in that moment the thing you said about it being theatrical i think that's also why i assumed first that claire jumped out the window i mm. thought this is something that would happen like a tragic a classic mm. play the this person cannot exist in both worlds they, they, they have to kill themselves that type of thing like the yeah, thing yeah. that happens in old plays that just seems a little bit over the top and i think mm. because it's so theatrical um like you said with all the different um tools of filmmaking it sort of does yeah. that really well and I thought oh right because she I think that's so interesting that you parents assumed that John had done it because yeah. that ending never occurred <laughs> Just, to me until I read up uh, on, it on the internet where I was like what do people interpret this ending to be after I read the book I was like what do you mean John, John wasn't, <laughs> what? I, just in terms Bad of take. proximity yeah. I just thought he was never close enough to her yeah to push and I think, sorry, something just occurred to me when you were talking about like the tragedy of Claire, like like the tragic trope. And I think in the book, it's that kind of like trope of like the tragic mulatto in like quotation marks, obviously not a yeah, word yeah. that like you'd use. There's, there is that trope of like the person who cannot exist in two worlds um, and sort of like not having the agency and having to die at the end. But actually having that ambiguity in a way doesn't take all the agency from Claire. Like even though yeah. it's sort of like sad and you don't know where the agency is, it's sort of like there is the kind of like possibility of agency in that moment. It's actually kind of making me think of, I watched Little Women over the holidays um, and it's like, really liked it, it was really good. But it's that kind of, again, you have that very ambiguous ending where it's like, did she marry, did she not marry? And you kind of like, cause there's that meta element, you don't, it makes it un it's deliberately unclear so that you can have like Joe be like single and happy or married and happy. It's kind of like Claire dead and with agency or dead without agency, but like, and it's still kind of like tragic in both senses, but like there's sort of like the, the question of agency is, it's the, it's the kind of same thing, but like tragedy instead of happiness, I guess. In of terms agency. of giving her agency and having her be less tragic, then your parents' first reading is better than mine. Because if you're saying that either, if you're saying like I did, that she jumped herself, you were saying that she was saying she cannot exist. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying that John killed her or that Irene killed her, you were saying the reason mm -hmm. that she cannot exist is because she herself, her existence is tragic. It's because the world makes it impossible. Like yeah. the world is pushing her out the window. Mm -hmm. This racist society is pushing her out the window. Yes. This heteronormativity is pushing her out the window, but not herself. So I yeah. like that better in terms of actually giving her some agency. And that's why these type of tropes are so horrible because you're like, well, you mm -hmm. cannot exist. You have to die anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. That sort of makes someone's life pretty much worthless or labels that as worthless. Yeah. This is still a person. <laughs> like, yeah. And I think it's a really good way of like engaging with like an old text. It's like with, mm -hmm. again, with Little Women and being like, oh, this ending was like kind of disappointing and like wasn't very like quote unquote feminist or whatever. And sort of like engaging with like a kind of like kind of a harmful trope and then engaging with it in a, in a way that do, like is aware of that and then yes. kind of does something with it that's not just kind of reproducing it and then also doesn't do a thing like the Disney remakes where they're like let's put some girl boss about feminism in here where it's not <laughs> needed you know it's like aware of a criticism that's a genuine criticism and then like um actually taking that on board in an interesting and thoughtful and like productive way there's nuance to all of this. In case you just have not never read Little Women or seen it, what Lily oh, yes, is right. referring there is that in the book, Joe, the main character, she ends up with this German professor. But yeah. Greta Gerwig actually wrote the script in a way where you sort of have possibilities. So yeah, yeah that's a really good comparison, actually. Again, a really old book being adapted. <laughs> I don't know if this is me reading too much into it, but when you start the movie, the first thing you hear is when you're underwater and you're hearing voices from outside mm, and then yeah. you sort of move up to what you said like the shoes you mm -hmm. watch and these figures you sort of the camera moves up and you realize two white women are entering a toy store and then you go through the movie and as Claire is sort of on the ground the camera moves up and goes into the sky and into the heavens basically and before you before it fades oh. to black it goes into it goes it into fades the to white, white snow yeah yes. yeah and then it goes into black you just move it always feels like throughout the movie you take this journey and into and then, the sky oh. <laughs> and then it's like and then claire takes the opposite kind of um 
direction because she falls as well so you're kind of like yeah, going the opposite yeah. and so many things fall in like the person who faints at the beginning of the book yeah yeah um and then like the pot the plant pot at one point and then the teapot at another point and then finally yeah. claire it's like the kind of like film is moving in the opposite direction to the action of the characters that's so yeah. good sorry i didn't think of that yeah is there like an omnipotence from that shot do you think it's kind of it's kind of like but it's also like it's the movies like undermine the idea of the omnipotent camera like the whole way through so like as it moves upwards it's like you still get that kind of but it it all becomes blurred because the snow gets in the way so even as yeah. you kind of take that it gets blurred but the light because it's that idea of like you know like kind of shadows and darkness kind of create like it's that enlightenment idea that like shadows and darkness um create like um obscurity and we need like the lightness to kind of like bring kind of clarity whereas it's like the kind of like whiteness in that final moment that sort of like you can't see anything in the in the screen because it's it is also a mode of like kind of changing your interpretation and changing your perception in that final moment i think we should move into a character section now <laughs> yeah so i thought claire was the most interesting part of this because it's mm. sort of the character that we know least about from her own words. Yeah. I feel like we sort of know least about her from her own perspective about herself. That's so interesting. Yeah. Because we, in the book, we mostly hear about Claire's childhood stories from not just Irene's perspective, but Irene's memories of what other people said about yeah. what Claire was like. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And it's like so much, because so much of the book is like, um, Irene describing what Claire looks like, kind of like the focus on like her lips and her hands and, and her eyes. And then in the film, it's like that you have those shots of like Claire's back and sort of like you have the idea of, you kind of see Irene gazing at Claire. Mm -hmm. And Claire does gaze back, but you still don't get the perspective of Claire. And it's always sort of the camera is turned on Claire. Although you do get a kind of, I think because you do have that camera, you do get the idea of Irene as well. You still because it's not just from her perspective, it's sort of showing you her perspective. You kind of get a sense of perceiving Irene as she perceives herself, um, just to kind of bring it back to that to that previous point. That's why I also sort of hesitated a little bit when you said the thing about the omnipotent character camera, because there's an objectivity with movie making where mm -hmm. a camera sort of, whatever the camera shows you sort of feels authentic and objective yeah. because you yourself are seeing it. When yes. you sort of see the flashback, I think this is used a lot in crime stories too. I think sometimes bad, sometimes good effect. And I think the movies plays with that maybe, of mm -hmm. both being omnipotent, but also being to Irene's perspective on this whole thing. Yes, definitely. Which again, definitely. I did not really pick up the first time. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. it's definitely a film you need to watch a few times. Um, I think also what you were saying about Claire and sort of like you never see things from Claire's perspective, just how people see Claire. I think ties to kind of the idea that maybe like Claire is kind of like a focus for different people's desires yeah and she's like she's always kind of shape-shifting to kind of like fit into what other people see from her like even though she's very self-possessed um as like a character she's always sort of like playing a part in other people's perceptions of her and she has like a certain again linking back to agency she has a certain amount of agency but also like not all of the agency it's kind of like quite a blurred and ambiguous thing the only time you see her express herself is through the letters, mm. which she specifically addresses to Irene, but then yeah. Brian is the one who reads them. <laughs> reads them, yeah, yeah, which is, okay. <sighs> yeah. And I mean, again, it's sort of like, she's like being told through multiple layers. Cause it's also like when Brian reads her letters, he's quite mocking and sort of like, he's like, oh, this is so yeah. like, dramatic. And sort of like, so when he reads it out, you're not even getting it straight from like, it's not even like Claire's voice reading out the letter. It's like another character reading her and like reading her like in you know, emotions. And it's like, how much can you like trust a letter? Any of like trust a letter, but like the kind of idea of like printer's authority. But it's like kind of going through so many lenses before it reaches Irene as well. The amount of emotions she expresses are very, like you said, adapted to the situation she's in. She's very mm. flirty and dancey at the dance hall. She's very fun and chatty at the tea party. But with Irene, she expresses, like she says, wild desire, if I hadn't seen you, wouldn't have come yeah. up for desire to go back to Harlem. Mm, and she's yeah. also like, the first time she comes to the Redfields house and talks to Irene, she cries about the prospect of Irene not wanting to see her because Irene pretty explicitly states that she doesn't want her there. That she says this is stupid or something to that effect and why would you put yourself in that kind of danger and then Claire just cries at the notion of Irene not wanting to spend time with her mm -hmm. like she doesn't I don't know I mean you could also say that she's quote unquote being manip manipulative mm -hmm. but I don't know that mm -hmm. that's like what would she gain from this 
yeah um, I think the text kind of challenges so I think that is like a reading that I think the film is aware of mm -hmm. but I think I don't know I'm kind of trying to think of textual evidence for this now but I'm like <laughs> I feel like the film is aware of that and the idea of like manipulation because again it's like passing could be seen as like a form of manipulation and kind of like malicious but the film kind of like pushes back against that yeah I just think that I don't think she gains anything really only from hanging out with Irene so I personally think it's because she desires to be with Irene yeah and she wants to be around her and she's Irene to her is also someone who like her has this experience of being able to pass but also being from different worlds and understanding that experience being yeah. in this binary setting of these laws you are someone who exists in both and she just desires to be around Irene for very different reasons but I do think she desires to be with Irene and she's the most honest I think and authentic mm -hmm. when she's with Irene alone yes yes I think I think it's interesting because Irene and Claire are so similar in many ways but also so different I kind of read them as like the two sides of the same coin yeah and there's like a very deep irony when Claire says to Irene I'm not like you one bit to get things I want I'd do anything hurt anybody throw anything away anything I'm not safe and it's deeply ironic when you get to the end of the text and the kind of again implied um idea that like Irene has pushed Claire out the window like she is the one Irene is incredibly, in a way, tyrannical, especially in the book, she's very tyrannical and it's sort of, it can only be her way. I mean, again, tyrannical, I, d I don't love, I guess I don't love using that word in terms of like, you know, the tyrannical housewife type thing, like, especially in relation to like Brian and being like, no, we're not going to move away. We're going to stay here. We're going to have this mm -hmm. life here. We're going to raise our kids in this way. Um, I think Irene gets even gets grumpy at the weather for not behaving the way that it should. She's <laughs> like, it was way too mild for like December. It was like too sunny. The idea that Claire is the one that, would do anything to get what she wants. Claire would do anything to get what she wants, but like Claire is that kind of instability, whereas Irene would do anything to kind of keep her stability. Um, yeah. And in the end, it's Irene who's the one that um, can, or it's implied anyway that Irene is the one. I mean, I guess it could be read either way, but like, yeah, it's deeply ironic. In uh, A Chosen Exile, in the book, uh, the writer, Alison Hobbs, she very much states that she says Claire has to stay white for Irene's life to stay safe. Claire is the person who brings out something in Irene, but she reads it as making her marriage unsafe. Yeah. It's not necessarily even that, mm. um, but it does cause some sort of instability in her stable, specific life in terms of class, which yeah. is why I think we could move on to Irene now. Yes. We sort of overlapped anyway. A yeah, bit. it's it's yeah. <laughs> they they overlap as characters though, interestingly, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> During an interview that I did not see, but they talked about it later, where Rebecca Hall said that Irene's character doesn't really know herself so much so that she doesn't know how to decorate her house. And Tessa Thompson <laughs> was quite offended by that. She was like, I like that couch. <laughs> <laughs> The idea was that 20s design was much more bombastic and much more like just more and mm -hmm. not as minimalistic as the house actually was then in the end in the movie because Ooh. Rebecca Hall decided that with the production design, I'm sure, that this person doesn't really know how to express herself and just goes to the safest thing that you just need and nothing too much. It's also it's this perception of performing for what people want you to be and not causing any, yeah. anybody yeah. to comment on your life. <laughs> yeah, it's like, again, it's like Claire. It's like Claire is like um, molding herself, shape-shifting to other people's desires. And for that, that for, for Claire, that means she's like kind of very out there and sort of very like kind of like boldly reacting to those desires. Whereas for Irene, it's like she's doing the same thing, but kind of minimizing herself in many ways, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Again, in the book, <laughs> uh, Alison Hall described that um, Irene's careful constructed life in her loveless but strategic <laughs> marriage, which, again, if you watch the movie, you might think that's a little bit harsh. It's, but honestly, in the so book, different. yeah. Yeah, in the book, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's so, I don't know, I remember just, for me, like, the experience of listening to the book, the book, the book <laughs> it always just feels very bleak. I just, like, I don't yeah. finish that book and feel joy. I feel no. like... Oh, like where I mean obviously in the film it's not massive like I mean the the ending is very tragic but like you do get that sense of joy you get you get that sense of joy in their marriage as well again we want to talk about this a bit more later but like Irene doesn't feel as grumpy and just like bleak and kind of like there's some st there's just something going on with Irene in the book where she just feels something's blocking her all of the time 
and there's like something that's always going to make her just like never never have that kind of happiness like she says at one point like she realizes that like Claire is maybe capable of like heights and depths of feeling that she she's never been she might never be capable of which is just like so and you're like Oof. this text you've actually read like part of a book I read the Wikipedia page um, and it's on the book and it said like you know there's quite a lot of queer reading around this yeah. text partly because of like passing and that obviously lends itself to queer reading and sort of like the idea of like hiding sexuality and yeah like kind of queerness you can pull out of the text so we are applying Wikipedia yes. to our watching of this movie to Rebecca Hall's reading of the text and then putting that into the screenplay and also what we took from both the book and the movie in terms of the queerness that we read into it. Although I do yeah. want to mention that Rebecca Hall said that Hugh, the writer in the movie, was gay in her head, in her canon of this. <laughs> and I already knew about this, but I was like, really? Yeah, it's interesting that it just was Rebecca Hall's, like, person. I wonder if there is any scholarship on Hugh in particular. I, on the Wikipedia page, apparently... Um, there's quite a lot of analysis around like Brian and queerness and like Brian as a queer character as well which I didn't pick up on in really in like the book or the film like on like either viewing slash reading um, but doesn't mean it's invalid it's an interesting possibility in terms of asexuality yes I do yeah okay because Brian. he's so dis because he's so the fact that he keeps mentioning that sex is a joke ah uh, see I picked up on that as like it's a joke because Irene is isn't like performing in like the kind of sexual way that he would like and sort of like it's a joke because it's like his expectations of sex didn't live up to yeah it, his marriage didn't live up to his expectations of sex and Which that was can be read as asexuality that's true though now that you're saying that that's true and it's like more but yeah i read it as like his disappointment in irene but then maybe it's that disappointment in just like the expectations that you have um, of sex yeah of sex and then it being like actually like all these things i was told to, that i should like about this thing didn't that's really that's a good point that i hadn't thought about that but that's really that's a really good point i just also thought this when i was re-listening to us and bob's burgers talking about feminism if you are confused about asexuality or like anything we're talking about queerness and you're like i didn't learn about this why don't i know this all of us, as far as I know, went to schools which did not talk about this in any length or... No. And again, when we talk about asexuality, you might think, oh, someone who doesn't like sex. Asexuality is a broad spectrum, again, of all these different identities and it mm. can uh, exist with different identities within bisexuality, pansexuality. These things are rarely one thing and one note. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you were saying that there are people who read Brian as uh, queer in terms of not being heterosexual do you mean yes which i think is interesting and sort yeah. of not again not something that i picked up on but the kind of big kind of queer reading of the text is obviously obviously the suffix subtext between claire and irene um which i think that again linking back to adaptation theory and the idea of like a uh, like an adaptation being kind of like a bunch of different texts not just the original text having an influence on it I mm -hmm. think the fact that there is quite a lot of scholarship around queer the queer readings of this text yeah. influenced, I, th I think that's quite an, an easy thing to state, is that it influenced the way that this film was was shot and the kind of like queerness that was sort of like emphasized within it. But yeah. it's like how the discourse around a text becomes um, mm. fanon, <laughs> becomes yeah. sort of canon of the fandom, even if those fans are academics, as <laughs> opposed to the original text or what was intentionally meant, because you don't yeah. know. Yeah. Also the idea of whether we care about what the author originally thought mm. or whether, you know, characters just sort of live more in your brain as you're reading it as opposed to what is actually on the page. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But we have so many moments where, like you said, there's so much sapphic subtext in this movie and in this book. And one of the things I didn't get as much from that scene, because you mentioned the dance hall, where mm. when Hugh is like, why don't you pass? Like, why don't you pass more? And she's in the script, in the screenplay, it says, under her breath, maybe I am. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but she's yeah. not saying it as loud as she could. It's under her breath. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And I found the thing that I mentioned before, which is, yes. I think, happens yes, just yes, about yes. that time. So um, they're talking about how Claire, oh, no, sorry, Irene can, like, kind of tell, like, another Black person. And, like, yes. she can kind of, like, pick up on that. And she says, like, there's, um, when she's, like, interacting with another Black person, she says, oh, like, no, no, we, there's a thing yes. that, that can't be registered. And he says, I understand that. And then they <laughs> sort of, like, share a note. And again, it's that kind of, like, 
the dialogue between like passing in terms of sexuality and passing in terms of race and sort of like there's that kind of solidarity that can definitely be read as a sort of like queer subtext as well. Yeah, and you have the ambiguity within the script because mm. that could one version of this is this is a gay person saying to her, I get what you mean. You can tell when one of us is in the room, essentially, like you can tell when someone is like like you in the room, but you can also read this because she calls him an ass at some point. He can also read this as a white person putting himself in a situation where he doesn't yeah. know what the, she's talking yes, about. Yes, But he true. wants to be yeah. in on the conversation. He wants to be like, yeah, I get that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I get that. It doesn't, it's like, no. it doesn't at all. <laughs> oh my God, that's so good. You can, again, read this as two different, completely different conversations. Him saying, I get what you mean. Or like, oh, no, no, yeah, I'm totally down. Like, I get what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do you do fellow kids type thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's such a, oh, I didn't notice that. It's so yeah. interesting. Do we want to talk about the hand at the dance? Because Yes, we do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because you were talking about how Irene is so unhappy for so much of this. One of the scenes I liked so much in this film, again, before I read the book and knew how unhappy <laughs> she was, but when she comes home and her husband's asleep on the chair and she just pulls him in and kisses him and then they sort of cuddle on the chair. It's so lovely. And you don't see her smiling again, I think, like that way until Irene. But at the dance, there's this mm. beautiful, beautiful shot. Claire has just danced with someone and returned. Hugh, I think, has left to get his wife, Bianca. Yes. Um, they're alone together in a room full of people, but this catch a moment. <laughs> and you see Claire's moving her body and dancing, and Irene reaches out and grabs her hand and looks up at her, and you just see, like, a happy smile that is just so beautiful. It's so, beautiful. It's so nice. They're returning the gaze, but they're also, like, holding on to each other's like there's also the touch as well like there's the gaze and the touch yeah it's like a very tender and again it's the the hand that also like holds either holds claire or pushes claire in that final scene as well oh god no <laughs> i'm sorry <Really? laughs> god, that's horrible yeah i think both of these actresses are just so good being able to sort of express because so much of this movie is the camera on tessa thompson's face um she's such a good actress that she carries that but it, that is still such an impressive skill but one of the things i noticed as well by the second viewing is that when ruth nega looks down at her you can read that so much as huh but also as this exchanging of again this uh, this idea that what hugh said can be interpreted as we know when we are around each other like i can tell someone else is queer you can read that as claire's checking with irene is like is that what you mean yeah and then when Brian approaches, they have to go off the hand. I know, the hands drop. And you're like, no. <laughs> I yeah. didn't notice that that's the same hand that pushes out the window. God damn it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, and there's also, like, there's so many other bits. There's, like, the part where yeah. they're, like, talking in the garden. And Irene's the like, garden, you, were, yeah. you were always the beauty. And like, Claire's like, not how I see it. Yeah. <laughs> that's also yeah. a very long gaze in that scene. And then you have that beautiful shot. Of Ruth, like as Claire just getting up and stretching in the sun, you yeah. only see like half of her face, but it's oh, it's shot so beautiful. You just know that that's you know that that's Irene's gaze looking up at this beautiful person in yeah. her garden because she's again in the book, again, she's like described as this like glowing thing as well. And it's like kind yeah. of like the kind of light that emanates, it's like Claire emanates light as well. It's not just that it's like on her, it's like she is the source of it as well. And <laughs> That's so Which... beautiful. That's also, that's so horrible, but that's also how Claire's been described in the death scene. One moment, Claire had been there, a vital oh, glowing yeah, yeah. thing, like a flame of red and gold. The next, she was gone. Yeah, that's what I meant, actually. But, like, it's okay. that kind of, and it's also kind of, like, that agency that she has in, like, kind of, like, how, because it's not just the light that's going on to her, it's as if she's emitting. The... She doesn't only reflect it, she yeah. creates but... it. She, yeah but then it's also like an interpretation of her like ref, um creating this light as well and sort of like and the danger that maybe creating that light does as well because it's sort of like she has this level of seeming agency that like irene can't cope with perhaps. describing someone as a magical thing is a little bit almost fetishizing them sometimes yeah definitely i think like Clara's definitely fetishized in this, in this in this book and in this film definitely Which which Irene talks about with Hugh when they talk about this idea of why white people come to 
these dances in Harlem yeah. and she says that there's some sort of repugnant feeling but there's also yeah. like this exoticism of the other of something that you are not familiar with and that's why people sort of desire something that they're not used to mm. and that yeah. yeah creating this idea of projecting your own feelings onto someone else and dehumanizing them in the process sometimes yeah because desiring someone and respecting them is not the same thing. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's yeah. true. I mean, I don't know how I feel about this. I don't know that I care that much about how intentional this was in terms of the author, mm -hmm. because I feel so sad for someone like Irene in a way. It would be so nice if you could read this and just see it as a, a possibility for your own life, that what is expected of you in terms of a partner or marriage or whatever mm -hmm. should not limit you to the point where you become so unhinged and unhappy with everything. And yeah. like you said tyrannical, but this idea of, I know that a lot of these words is coded and gendered, but that's mm. because of sexism. That's not because people yeah. aren't this as well, but this controlling notion that she has, because there's so much about her life she cannot control. She just controls the things that she has power over. That's true. That's and, true. And her actions are part of that, except for that hand. And yeah. it's like the one moment where she allows herself to grasp of what she wants. I like that yeah. reading a lot better. Yeah, it's like, I like the interpretation, the perception, and the hand is the agent. So like the eyes are kind Ooh. of agency over others, but then you can also be gazed back at, and then the hand is, again, is also agency, and that hand can like hold or it can push away. I it's know. also this idea yeah. of love is, or like falling in love is something that biological is out of your control. Mm -hmm. Because in the book, she smells clear before she sees her. She smells something sweetly scented. And I just, I don't know. That's enough yeah. for me to be like, oh, queer, <laughs> queer. <laughs> when Claire cries that Irene doesn't want to be with her, she feels rejected. Mm. The yeah, there's so much. In. And Claire really like invo invokes that kind of idea of like the kind of like spurned lover as well. When she's like, oh, you know, when I kept going to the post office, like they must have thought I was having an affair and I wasn't being like responded to. Like she kind of like hints at this as well in a way that I think makes Irene slightly uncomfortable. She kind of like hints at the idea of like a kind of like a sapphic relation. And, and then she's like, I wouldn't feel this wild desire if I hadn't met you. And it's sort of like this desire to kind of like be around black people and black culture, but also kind of this desire that's sort of like, it's like a kind of like queer desire at the same time. So linking back again to kind of adaptation theory, sorry, this is a quote, adaptation might in this instant be seen, instance be seen as responding directly to the work of critical theory. And in this case, Sanders is talking about Mansfield Park and how they were in, a, in an adaptation, I can't remember which one, but they were like, uh, highlighting links to colonialism um oh, yeah. from the books and so and that's kind of the <laughs> linking to criticism of Mansfield Park in like not kind of like these silences that are within this this text and actually kind of the colonialism that this lifestyle is built on in this case the queer criticism in a way kind of like oh like a lens that this adaptation is bringing to this a lens through which the adaptation is using to adapt i've messed up what i was saying there but you go on <laughs> because of the yeah. queer reading in academic discourse you mean this exactly like, in mansfield park it's done so badly oh and, really like, rebecca hall is doing this really well in a way where you can pick it up if you want to and she, also she's not doing the shitty thing that directors now do where they put like qu the queer baiting crap and like the yeah this film isn't queer baiting because it, the intention isn't to like you know bait people into watching something by kind of like giving a bit of like kind of queer subtext but then not actually kind of giving you like actual representation because I, I remember yeah. when you first when we first talked about passing you said that like you heard about it as like a queer text but like you but it was like gay but not and so you didn't want to watch it or you didn't want to read it but read it it would have been because it was before the film was made is that right sometimes the discourse overtakes a work to the point where if you engage with the book itself and you think that it has queerness in it and then it has it has things in it that are queer mm -hmm. i'm not saying that it doesn't but it's not explicit enough and sort of feels like a letdown when you actually read the book yeah. You watch the movie and you're like, what do you mean queer? Where, where is this queerness? <laughs> and I do think that it is in this book, but that's what I was kind of scared of in terms of it's sort of letting me down in that way. Although I'm yeah. not entitled to any kind of uh, queerness in a book from 1929. But, and I mm. also like the fact that Rebecca Hall, is, um, because there was also an interview that I read where she talked about engaging with both Runega and uh, Tessa Thompson about this. And she asked them, do you see sexuality in this? And they were like, yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> like they were all in agreement of what they yeah. saw on the page. And I think that's also why it works so well. Yeah. But there's just so many movies out now that's go like, this is our first queer character or whatever. And then it's nothing or it's completely useless. Yeah. 
I feel like Rebecca Hall respects the queerness of both the original work, the queer discourse, and also just queerness in general in this work without feeling like she's preaching to me. And yes. that never happens. I Yes, I couldn't That's agree just, more. Yeah. And I think that's why it's not queer baiting because it's so no, it's, it, it's intentional. It's yeah. very intentional. And it's like also kind of within it's very it's intertwined within the text, like integral to the text. And it's integral yes. that it's subtle as well because it's all about passing and it's all about this sort of like, yeah, this kind of like hiding and perception and undertones. And that's why this is a really good film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's just so much about queerness in modern interpretations. It's about what you can sort of insert and understand in terms of where you can sort of place yourself, even if you're not specifically represented. Mm -hmm. And it's just nice for someone to be aware enough of queerness without using it as like a selling point for awards and stuff, yeah. but respect it enough to give it the space that it deserves and still leave all this ambiguity in it where everybody can take different things out of it. I just yes. thought that was really interesting. We still want to talk about the asexuality, which we also mentioned already a lot. Yes, I think so. I was so offended when this dude said to his wife, and I don't care how she feels about him at that point, when he says to her, because they're talking about their son, the younger son, hearing about sex at school. And he's saying it's sort of better that he learns about this sooner there rather than later. And she goes, what? And he goes, that sex is a joke. This is so offensive to say to someone. The way that she responds to this tells you that they've never talked about this before in that context. The expectations that we have of sex or like what we sold about sex or whatever doesn't live up to what, what then happens because it's just not real, right? It's sort of performed for us in movies and stuff mm. in a way that's meant to happen. And that's just not the reality of it, but that's yeah. not the conversation they're having. <laughs> and <laughs> no, it's that kind oh. of, it's the it's what goes unsaid as well. It's again, it's that idea of like passing as like kind of like happy heterosexual marriage, but like yeah. clearly something is wrong here. And so when you first, so yeah, we were messaging about this film and you said something about asexuality. Did you mean that you thought that like, no, you read, you said you read Irene as asexual, right? Or like there was like a possible asexual reading of Irene. I think in terms of like the queerness reading that it was possible for Irene, especially in the book, feel so dissatisfied with the life that she mm. has where I thought there's possibility that she's both not, I don't think she's romantically interested in her husband. I don't think she's sexually interested in her husband. And I think there's a possibility of both sexual wise or romantics, well, uh, romantics, <laughs> romance wise <laughs> being interested in Claire to yes. me. But I think mm -hmm. you can read it both ways. I think that Irene is super frustrated because she was expected to like this, to yes. have a husband, have a housemaid, have two children, sons is even better, right? Um, <laughs> and then she has this big house and she isn't happy. No, she's deeply, she's so tired, she's tired all the time. Yeah. She's late to everything and she's deeply bored whilst also being like constantly on edge. It's interesting because it's like a deep investment in heterosexuality or like heteronormativity yes. that we see, especially in like everything you just said, like kind of family and like house and like, yeah, and that kind of like kind of middle class heteronormativity with like the servant like as well. And that kind of, I guess like kind of bourgeois malaise kind of thing where she's just like, you have all these shots of her like kind of like tied in the house. And kind of like and the kind of clock ticking and that passing of time she's like feeling very unfulfilled and it's oh, sort of like a good point yeah the clock is really good yeah and that kind of i guess the sexuality element is like a part of that it's sort of that kind of feeling of unfulfillment and you're not and it's like that could be read in, in like a kind of like she's just it's an extension of how unfulfilled she feels in this marriage or it's like kind of an asexual reading as well which is really interesting kind of like actually this doesn't work for this character and like this is a very kind of like constricting kind of thing and like kind of through the lens of sexuality as well. It just doesn't seem to give her what she truly desires, but it also isn't clear that she, I think until Claire shows up, knows what she wants though. There's not really like a huge moment, I think, before that person shows up where she realizes, because she does have, she does this charity work, she does organize these things. And according to her husband, this is quite a lot of work still, but yeah, she just doesn't seem happy or content i should say yes even though she says that she's what she say like satisfied she says like i like 
I don't know Brian says something like nobody's satisfied or something she's like I am satisfied I'm satisfied yeah, yeah. instantly undermined by like <laughs> her being like so bored yeah she's definitely not just saying this to Brian as a response because he says because they talk about this idea of passing of Claire just mm. not being happy being yeah apart it's like show don't tell Irene like <laughs> show don't tell. but by saying that she's satisfied you're like yeah you're not <laughs> no anything the characters say is just false and every, anything they do is ambiguous we don't know what's going on in this film yeah um but I do think it's interesting as well though because I think in the book it's a lot more you get a, a sense that like Irene is a more asexual character or isn't satisfied with her sexuality or like something's going on there whereas in the film there's a sense that there is like at least a sensuality to their relationship like you kind of like have her initiate like a kiss with Brian and they sort of like and then he she like sits on his lap in that foot when she when like yeah, when cuddle, she comes back yeah. from Claire and she's it's like kind of like oh I'm so I guess it's partly kind of like oh I'm so happy to have this stability in like my husband she's just come back from Claire and like her husband abusing her or like kind of using racial slurs and she's like yeah. being very unstable so it's like kind of like kind of like reveling in that stability of home which becomes unraveled you also get like a sense of their relationship being a lot more loving and also a bit more sexual as well in the film and so it kind of feels a bit weird when he says like sex is a big great joke like it's like a great joke because it you kind of don't necessarily get that sense that it or at least not to start off with anyway that like this marriage is like a sexless marriage i agree you um, can read that scene where they cuddle us both ways these are two people who's content in a marriage at least you think that for that bit but also this is right after she's seen an old school friend of hers being referred to by a racial sir as a cutesy name like honey he doesn't mm. just call her the n-word this is his nickname for his wife yeah like, and irene just laughs and it's the most terrifying thing in that entire movie i think where she just laughs and there's no joy in her eyes because it's just about the perversity of this moment of these two mm. black women sitting with a guy who just openly admitted that he hates black people yeah and you just sit there and, and she just starts laughing and you're like oh dear god because i think irene kind of invokes like children and like the idea of like reproductive futurity like when claire's like um uh, you know oh, yeah. I, I really want to visit you guys in harlem and she's like no claire it's dangerous think about your daughter what about your daughter what if right. like and, and I think in the text, it describes her as like using it as a weapon against Claire. And um, to not bring in too much queer theory, but just a little bit. Ah, oh God, what's the name? Somebody or the Edelman. But he has this idea of like reproductive futurity and kind of that being the kind of structuring of heteronormative society and this like investment in the child as the future. And his idea is that like we need to metaphorically kill the child because this child never grows up and it's always this idea of a future that will never come. It's sort of the recreation of the present. It's basically just the present never changes because it's always a promised future um, that's just a reproduction of the present. Yeah, and it's this kind of investment in the heteronormative present that she's sort of invoking when she think of the children, Claire, and Claire says being a mother is the cruelest thing in the world. I think, yeah. again, because of the way that this movie creates and shows so many intersections of identity you can also link that back to agency because the heteronormativity thing about having a husband and then children ties you more into the side that you quote-unquote picked which you didn't pick and mm. for Claire it's about if she's outed then her daughter is outed as well yes. because of the one drop rule yes she's immediately then black her daughter right now is white as soon as it's found out she's no longer white her daughter mm. isn't either and again but because the movie is done so well this 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 line having children is the cruelest thing in the world can also be read as because so much of this movie is also about these two people disagreeing on how much they should discuss the realities of being black in america with their sons mm. yeah and so this idea of the cruelty in terms of having children can also be read in terms of this is someone yeah. that you will care about so much more than you will ever care for yourself yeah. And in a world where you cannot protect someone else 100% of the time. Yeah, that's, that's so, so interesting. So cruel. It's so cruel. And I think in that moment, because in the film, because in the book, I think Claire says, like, being a mother is the cruelest thing in the world. And I don't think Irene says, like, yes or anything. But whereas in the film, she says, I know or something along with, she, like, affirms that. And I think it's interesting because I think, at least the way I read it, kind of when Claire says being a mother is the cruelest thing in the world, it's sort of more of a reflection of, I feel like this is a kind of restriction on me, like, you know, by being myself or like by doing following my desires that means that I'm going to have to hurt someone else and that's sort of like something that's quite painful to me 
which is very valid. Whereas I think what you just said about um, sort of like having to like bring up your children in like a white supremacist society, it's for, for Irene, there's that kind of, it's the cruelest thing in the world because of that. So, sooner or later, her sons are going to have to encounter this and she knows that um, and she's trying to repress that. Um, and so for her, maybe it's more, or maybe it's a bit of both for both of them, to be honest. I feel yeah, like it's maybe yeah. not, it's probably not like one or the other. It's, it's, a, it's a mixture. Yeah. I think can I just read this for Irene? Yeah, can sorry, I just read what it says in the in the book? So she says, I think she said at last that being a mother is the cruelest thing in the world. Her clasped hands swayed forward and back again, and her scarlet mouth trembled irrepressibly. Yes, Irene softly agreed. For a moment she was unable to say more. So accurately had Claire put into words that which, not so definitely defined, was so often in her own heart of late. There we go. Yeah, and I think, yeah. And I think that implies that they're kind of thinking about it in two different ways, but then also it kind of applies to both of them. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Did you say that his name was Lee Edelman? Lee Edelman, yeah, yeah, sorry. Just, to, yeah, the uh, queer theorist, reproductive fu futurity guy was Lee Edelman. Because that was super interesting in terms of how this idea of, what's it called, futurative? Reproductive futurity. That's it. <laughs> how that ties into this. Oh, that's yeah. so interesting. There's also a moment in the book when Irene says security was the most important and most desired thing in life. Mm -hmm. Like it couldn't mm -hmm. have been stated more clearly. Yeah, <laughs> like this literally. <laughs> well, we talked about ambiguity and one of the things about the end in terms of ambiguity is that when Irene finally comes down after everybody's already rushed downstairs and the police have arrived, you see Irene's going towards her husband. You see her like looking a little bit to the right. And then her husband says something like, don't look. Mm -hmm. But he embraces her as she makes this groaning noise. And he grabs her and hugs her. And you have that moment when she sort of collapses. Yes. And her husband just embraces her, like mm -hmm. holds her so she can be upright. And he just says, I love you. Which feels so out of place in that scene in a way. Yeah. Until you think that she killed her because you're like, what does that have to do with anything right now? Because, I mean, you can't read it as giving her literally a crux. Mm -hmm. Literally something to walk on right now. Remember, like, as bad as the situation right now is, I love you. Yeah. I mean, we can read that in many different ways. Yeah, I think it's really interesting as well because it's like Irene's paranoia is what drove her to like pushing Claire out the window or potentially drove her to pushing Claire out the window. Right. Um, and I think it's that sort of like, like Irene realizes that her and Claire are very similar and that kind of presents a threat to her because that means the danger is becoming too integrated into her home life. Like she can't see herself in Claire. And so she mm -hmm. has to cut it out and her marriage is like the last straw because that's her stability, her heterosexual, like her heteronormative future. Sorry, I'm kind of jumping ahead a bit, but like the kind of queer, like kind of love triangle that you kind of get with Claire, Irene and Brian yeah. um, kind of becomes too much for her. Um, and she's sort of like, no, I need to have this sort of like stability in this heteronormative marriage. And so that kind of final I love you, she gets what she wants, but also it kind of implies there was no affair to begin with or that like there was no threat to Irene because Brian loves her. I don't know. What do you think? In the second viewing, I've noticed that you don't really get a lot of shots of just Brian's face. He's usually in a scene with someone else. You see mm. him with Claire, you see him with the kids, you see him with with his wife, but you don't really get a whole lot of shots of just his face, or yeah. just the framing of his face. But mm. there's a scene where she's they're about to go downstairs for the tea party, and there's a moment when he looks, and it's about that uh, Irene didn't invite Claire to this party, but Brian yes. did. Yeah. And you get that moment where Andre Holland, again, is doing amazing acting. <laughs> He's just, <laughs> it's, I think it's, it's the one moment when I, one of the two moments where I thought that maybe the affair really did happen. Because ah. that face can be both read as, oh my God, I really fucked up something for my wife here by inviting Claire. Or as uh, she's like, she's caught on to us. And the second thing is that we talked about that scene where you sort of go downstairs with Irene's gaze and you see them standing really close together but then it's just the reflection of the mirror they're really far apart the second time you have that same shot mm -hmm. you go downstairs and they're actually standing not just like closer to each other than you thought but closer than is 
polite in society I'm no, assuming in the 1920s definitely not co- yeah and <laughs> definitely not COVID safe <laughs> no this is an intimate moment very intimate between yeah. two people here and you just in that moment realize okay the affair might be happening actually yeah I think it's interesting that moment see first time around I definitely interpreted or I you know was it like the, the affair is definitely happening second viewing that moment when yeah he's about to go downstairs that face he makes I thought it was more like it's his realization that he realizes that she thinks he's having an affair it's that realization oh. that like oh god my wife is so parent like I can't say anything. Everything I'm doing is just making her more and more paranoid. She has no trust in me. This is her interpretation and her perception of me. How could she perceive me in this way? And she just sort of like is like, well, what can I do? And that's why he then doesn't try and talk to her because he's like just a bit like shocked that he, she would view him in that way. It's that realization. I that never thought I of it. that interpretation. That's so good. That's so interesting. His shock is less about the... Um... It's about the way he's being perceived. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. Because yeah. again, I've, I've mentioned this before, but there's that scene where he sort of goes in for a kiss and then it goes in for a second one and she pulls away from him. Mm. Again, this could be read as him actually as being, he desires his wife, but she doesn't view that back and projects all of her paranoia onto him and makes mm-hmm. a decision about the marriage based on that as opposed to what's actually happening or not happening because I also think that when he invites Claire to the party I think part of what that is because we've just had that bit where um Irene is like very feverish and sort of like going in it swinging out of consciousness like when Claire like goes off she 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 goes to Europe I think this is when like Claire's gone off to Europe because of her daughter from school because of her daughter yes and she's and Irene's just had a confrontation with Brian where she said that like you seem a lot less satisfied with what you have when Claire isn't here and I'm like so do you Irene like right back at you (laughs) because immediately you get her kind of like yeah, she goes into that sort of weird sort of like fever fever dream sort of state where she's like um, tiredness and her boredom will kind of like catching up to her. And you see her like kind of silhouette of Claire that she's imagining and she's mm-hmm. like clearly very ill and not doing very well. And so my interpret again, in the film, my interpretation was that Brian maybe invited Claire to the party because he knew that Irene needed her and that like she's not doing well without her and they both need her in their lives. And yeah that was I was maybe Brian just thought he was doing a nice thing and then realized that Irene thought that he was having an affair and was just you know what I don't know what I can do right anymore I was just trying yeah. to be nice and there's also that scene where they go out with Hugh as a couple and Hugh makes really inappropriate comments about yeah, Claire like so passing and just has yeah. no business mm-hmm. judging a black woman's actions yeah. from a white man's perspective. Yeah, no, no business. And because Brian defends Claire in that moment because he says something to the notion of you have you have no business saying this or this is way too far or this is going way too yeah, far. Yeah, she's not here to defend herself. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And not even being that defensive. And then Hugh immediately sort of picks up on this and goes, Oh, you being just chivalrous or something which I understand that in that moment, Irene is again, this is just another argument for her to sort of perceive Brian as defending Claire as someone that he cares about, which might very well be true. From the looks of it, they do seem to get along quite well, which is fine. Yeah. (laughs) But also just a black man being like, "Um, you don't know what you're talking about. You should not be talking like out of, again, because Brian in the beginning was so judging this idea of people passing, right? But again, mm. that's a very different conversation than with Hugh, who has no business judging this. Like, I have no business judging this, right? You just don't get to make notions about what that says about Claire as a person, about the yeah. decisions she's had to make. But in that moment for Irene, that's just another argument that this must be true. And I like the idea that the three of them could have just, I mean, not Hugh, Irene, Brian, and Claire could have just been a very good, like, Harlem Renaissance throuple. Because yeah, I know. That's what they would have had such a good time. They would have, and it's like it clearly could have. Re- you all really like each other, and especially yeah. when Claire's there, it's like again the fan fiction writes itself. Like <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Irene get on so much better. Well, aside from the paranoia and the stuff, but that's because of like heteronormativity and like all these yeah. sort of like norms and conventions, blah, blah blah. Like they get on so much better when Claire's there. Claire's obviously very happy there. Irene's so much happier when Claire's around. 
Um, and it brings out another side of herself that is missing when she's just with Brian. And yeah, honestly, I get big James Thomas Miranda vibes, um, <laughs> like to, to bring it back to Black Cells, but like <laughs> it could have been, re- it could have been so good. Yeah. And that's, that's my personal favorite reading and my personal fan fiction is that, you know, they all just get along as a thrapple in um, the Harlem Renaissance. Also, none of this um, negates any of the asexual, aromantic things we talked mm-hmm. about. Oh, yeah. I do think from the beginning of the moment when you see, also when Irene and Brian talk about, should I drive because you're tired and just having kids and everything, they do seem to make a good pair or like good partners. Yes. Like good responsible think... partners. And like yeah. Claire kind of brings the fun. It's kind of like, guys, you <laughs> need to live a little bit. Come on. Yeah. But I just think, yeah, it just, none of this negates anybody's experiences or feelings or identities. The only thing that's holding them back is this heter- these heteronormative rules mm-hmm. about, yeah, this idea of, you know, to a pair. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, it's just, it's just so sad that, you know, this all ends in such a tragedy when it didn't have to. It should yeah. have just ended in just a more improved life for everybody involved. I mean, yeah. it would have been shit for Claire because there's no way in hell she would have gotten her access to a daughter. Yeah, no, there's no, there's no, yeah. To be fair, there's no kind of like complete happy ending because that's just not, well, the, yeah, the times and like Jim Crow era and yeah. What you said was so true that both, both Brian has <laughs> stated and made it clear that he thinks that Irene needs Claire and Irene has stated to Brian that she <laughs> thinks that he's happier. <laughs> when God, it's there. like, what? What could this mean? What? What is the possible solution? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think, okay, sorry to bring this one more time back to um, heteronormativity and also like kind of Irene's um, desire for like stability. Yeah. Um, it says in the text that um, Claire brought the menace of impermanence, and. I think again you can link that to the idea of having like a permanent and stable identity and like Irene wanting to have that kind of stability that kind of like knowing who she is and kind of having a stable identity um kind of like this middle class life that she really wants obviously like the kind of throughout the novel and through the film and the text itself challenges the idea that you can have that stable identity because it's also blurred context dependent and dependent on other people and I thought we could also link that to the idea of a text stability and the idea that there can be any one true permanent stable meaning to a text that isn't refracted um, through multiple different adaptations and that isn't like a master author or a master text. I mean, that's kind of the point when you said that the fan fiction writes itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that any text only exists on its own and should only be ruled over by one person. Yeah. Or that it's ever finished. Like, yeah. Yeah. Because you because you can just carry like as we're talking right now we're kind of creating more kind of stuff about this text we're sort of like adding to the discourse around it and kind of refracting it some more and kind of maybe make encouraging other people to refract it some more yeah wow, even that, even beyond what rebecca hall thought of this text even beyond what other people might have thought of this text and it mm. kind of makes me sad as maybe problematic but still very interesting this mo- uh, this could have been when it was made before i just wish there were more interpretations even and adaptations of this text because it would be so interesting to see a play version of this from mm. the 30s or like a movie version of this from the 50s or 60s i just wish yeah. that there were more more adaptation yeah and like everybody again tessa thompson with nega talked about this that they were both so shocked that when they read it first that they were like what do you mean this hasn't been adapted before <laughs> like not this like theme of passing that's existed in other movies mm-hmm. but especially also like racial passing even like movies from the 30s and 50s but this specific story being being that it is so rich it's just so strange i mean it's Racism, sexism, yeah. misogyny. It's like, racism, <laughs> sexism, misogyny, yeah. <laughs> but um, it's just so sad that there isn't... I yeah. love the idea of like reading everybody's take on... I love that your parents had the different interpretations would have, or a different one than you did, just because you read the book. Do we want to talk about this idea of Brian wanting to leave? Oh, I think that's the thing that's negated the affair for me the most. I thought this is not a dude who's trying to figure out a way to stay in New York. This is not a... I thought that he wasn't really thinking about an affair. I thought that Mm. he was just so exhausted from... Imagine what a black doctor would have seen in the 20s. Mm. I just imagined that he was so more... Not that love and affairs and things 
cannot take up a lot of part of your mind at the same time but I just thought that he yeah. was thinking so much more about the big picture in mm. terms of trying to uh, create some sort of safety for his sons yeah. I mean not that he had a very naive understanding of what Brazil was going to be like because I mean that's a, an ex-Portuguese um, co colony like right? yeah 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 so I just not that that's not a strange idea that for me was also a very good argument for this not being an affair because it just, I just thought he was so much more concerned about the reality for his sons as a black man yeah. raising two black boys. I just thought that he was so much more concerned about that rather than, I don't know, yeah. hanging out or going to tea parties for Hugh or whatever. That's true. And it's like those layers of privilege as well, because he couldn't pass, whereas like Irene yeah. can pass. Yeah. And so like he's like expert, he has to like deal with these things that she wants to try and like kind of protect her, like quote, but like protect her boys from and like kind of try and pretend that it doesn't exist because in a way she kind of can try and kind of get away from that, but it always kind of catches up to her as well. And I guess the ending, so it ends with her, with him saying, I love you. Claire is no longer there. What happens next? Like, I guess the, the ending kind of implies that they stay on in America and that kind of Irene eventually got her way. She, she en ends up getting what she quote unquote wants, but not actually what she wants, mm -hmm. I suppose. I remember, I mean, this is a very different context, but when we talked about promising young woman, mm -hmm. I thought it was so odd that it ended with police. And in this case, I just thought when the police oh, yeah. showed up, I immediately was like, oh, no. I just thought that it was the fact that they were asking whether John was the one that pushed her was so yeah. odd to me because I just assumed that someone seeing a seemingly white woman being in the snow being dead, I just wouldn't have assumed that the cops would be like, would... oh, yeah, it was the husband, right? You would be like, yeah. no, no, no. I just assumed that the cops would blame anybody else in yeah. that group. And so I was kind of confused about that because I just... Yeah, it was a confusing moment. Because it just yeah. associate cops with danger. I just assumed that there would be so much more danger to the party of people from the mm. police, rather than the police being the ones that ask her, did John push her? Was John near the window? Mm. And also John sitting in the snow next to his dead wife. Because in that moment, his entire... Not that there's any kind of sympathy or empathy I'm extending to this dude, but mm. this entire family, his entire understanding of his marriage is breaking down in that moment, right? Because when the cameras pulled out and didn't give us the reaction of what happens next. No. In a lot of movies, there's a desire to see what happens next. And in this, I don't want to know in a yes. way. And I think yeah. it's because of, maybe it's also because of the thing you said about, maybe it's just too depressing to yeah. think about Irene having stayed in the same place, having learned nothing from this, in order for her life to stay safe, she had to get rid of Claire. That's kind of the worst of the, that's not a good ending. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's really, you summed it up really well though. I know, I think it's in a way, it's kind of the ending that maybe needed to happen, that it's still ambiguous to an extent, but also being like, you kind of get pointed in a direction, but you don't get to see the, like, because, you know, the camera pulls up, um, and as you go further up, instead of getting a better sense of that film, of like what's going on, um, you become, it becomes more obscure from the snow and also from the distance. Ooh. No, usually when you pull out, you get more of a sense mm. of the situation. You don't get that here at all. No, <laughs> it becomes more obscure. And again, it's like you're plunging back into that ambiguity. And I guess also because you move so far, like, so the, the camera ends on Claire. So once again, you're gazing at her body and it's like her dead body now. So it's even more like she's like an object, this gaze. I guess it's no longer Irene. It's the gaze is no longer being kind of like oh, yeah, refracted yeah, through Irene because the story's kind of ended now. So it just kind of like, because it's, it's not like caught by anyone in particular, it becomes just like swept up into the storm of the snow. So you don't kind of get a lens and a perspective anymore it becomes obscured in the way that like light can obscure because it can refract it in different ways and so it just it becomes like there's too much of that light and in, into the snow um <laughs> and i've lost my train of thought but you were so tied to irene's gaze upon this whole situation mm -hmm. and her interpretation of everything that goes on when she does it when she pushes her out the window that's when it ends yes yeah no it ends and and so in that final moment because it's no longer refracted through Irene's gaze it's you as an audience looking at this and thinking what what do I make of these events what do I make of yeah. this thing 
and it's like is it clear no it's not as it kind of like <laughs> ascends into like the whiteness it's like what's going on yeah it's asking you as an audience to think about okay so you've had it from this perspective what do you like what, what, what kind of perspective are you bringing to this in that final moment because everything beyond this is now just chaos because you yeah. now have a wife who committed murder <laughs> and a husband who has to reckon with that and john i mean fuck him but like <laughs> quest to sort of continue with dealing with what just happened here and the fading to white and then into black is sort of like again it's play the the film is playing with kind of filmic conventions um in a way that sort of like blurs the end like where the end the film ends like you, you kind of like as the Beamish becomes more, more obscured by snow into like that whiteness and so it's sort of like where does the di the like diegetic thing that you're watching become like the end of the film that's like the non-diegetic part yeah so it's sort of again blurring re the real and the unreal and asking you to think about th the fact that you're watching a film and think about your perceptions as you watch that film it reminded me a little bit of like old school when you used to watch those old TVs and when the VCR, when the oh. tape would stop and then you just have snow. Yeah, the like the static. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's like, Doo. yes. Oh my God. That's so good. Ah, <laughs> oh, this film is so good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm claiming that to be canon because Rebecca Hall is older than me. So she was experienced with those old TVs. <laughs> yes. It's a hundred percent canon. We can say that with a hundred percent certainty because we are the authors now. <laughs> Do you imagine a generation that grows up with streaming will just oh be using God. like I don't know buffering is like a tool. oh yeah <laughs> oh I bet no that's going to be such a, a symbol in like future filmmaking absolutely absolutely I feel like it's already I, you see it in so many things it's kind of parodied already but it's like a hundred percent going to be a feature of the streaming age and like the kind of people who came of age in the streaming age oh that's so interesting I can't wait to see it I can't wait to see it. Because of our whole discussion, thank you for listening. This was a long <laughs> one. If you have any opinions on this film, please. I don't care how long it is. I will beat it I thought, happily. <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, if you've got any opinions on this film, I don't care. <laughs> Again, Sorry. when we talk about pre-read text, about uh, preconceptions, what we love is getting more people's perceptions. Mm -hmm. And I always enjoy reading other people's interpretations of anything. Yes. Because if you engaged with anything and sort of took your own, because you only ever take your own gaze to things because it's all the perspective you have, it's still valid and I want to hear it. <laughs> Unless you were like, I don't know, this needs to be rewritten from John's perspective. Yeah. And one day maybe I will watch a movie where Alexander Skarsgård plays a nice person. I feel like I've only ever seen him being an abuser, uh, uh, like someone who beats his wife, a murderer. Like you're just a racist. Yeah, I, I didn't. I did kind of recognize his face and his name, but I can't think of what I've seen him in other than that. He's like the most obvious uh, nepotism baby. His father is Stellan Skarsgård, and he has like I think like twelve kids or something. I'm making this up, but like I think like six or eight or something. And like a lot of them are sons, and a lot of them are actors. Oh, it's the guy. <laughs> it's the guy from Mamma Mia. <laughs> Sorry, oh, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it took me a second. I was like, Alex from the Scars card was not in Mamma Mia. No, no the dad was. Yeah. But his dad was. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, yeah, of course, it's been in a billion other things. Now that it's like Pirates of the Caribbean, I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, his brother, I mean, I did oh, not watch yeah. this movie because I like to sleep at some point, but his yeah. brother played um, the, the clown in It in the newest. Uh, oh, of it. No. Yeah. yeah. So, as always, we have recommendations for you. Yeah. And Lily, would you like to start? Yes. Um, so I met up with a friend from university who graduated a while ago um, last week. Sorry, this is a bit of a bit too much context. Um, but yeah, no, that was nice. Um, but she reintroduced me um, to um, she reintroduced me to Pokemon Go, basically, which is a game that I didn't play at the time because I didn't have enough storage space on my phone back in like 2015 or whenever it launched. So I didn't get to play it. And so I'd never experienced the joy, the pure utter joy that is Pokemon Go until like this past week. And I've been like playing, I've been walking my little Pokemon. I've been like catching things in Pokeballs and I'm having a wonderful time. It's still on there. 
um, please come join me and add me on Pokemon Go so we can send each other gifts and things. It's good fun. No way in hell did I think that your recommendation this week would be talking Pokemon Go. I just love the fact that you're like the queer theory into with the Lee Edelman. I like to surprise, you know. I <laughs> So you contain multitudes. Unexpected. Exactly, I contain multitudes. I'm like a refracted piece of text. I don't know. I, I'm like that mirror. I look in the mirror. I see many <laughs> reflections. <laughs> and I have an identity crisis. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. I do want us to get those hats. I love that that like went over her eyes to the point where you could still see out of it, but she yeah. could sort of like disguise herself as much as you, she wanted. Also, I will say I, I'm, I have such a weird face shape that I do think this is probably not going to suit me or something, but I do still want that hat. No, um, <laughs> you, I think you'd look great in that hat. It'd be fantastic. Um, so my recommendation would one very, it's a very good book. My recommendations for this week is one, a book that is very connected to this um, topic, which is The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett, which is a book that I read way before I read Passing because a friend our most loyal fan Loretta <laughs> yes Loretta My shout out friend. to Loretta our number <laughs> one fan our number one fan out of 101 um, <laughs> you are the number one <laughs> um she sort of talked to me about this book and said that she had read it and I wanted to read it as well and and I really enjoyed it and she also wrote a forward for the new edition of Passing oh. <clears throat> which makes sense <laughs> and <laughs> yes but because we were talking about adaptation theory so much and you taught me so much today. I wanted to switch <laughs> it to a song called When He Sees Me, which is sung by oh. Kimi Kimiko Glenn. But the reason I wanted to uh, recommend it is because one, that song is beautiful because it's, yes, I'm stretching this. <laughs> it is, um, that this song is actually covered a lot on TikTok by queer people and it's a lot of the time sort of turned into when she sees me or when they mm -hmm. see me and so in a queer context what if she when she sees me she opens the door and I cannot close it that's so much more in terms of what if I allow myself to sort of engage with that side of myself that I've mm -hmm. never engaged with before so there's also yeah. beautiful queer reading wow to the song. Oh, wow and you did people... a really good job in these <laughs> <sorry>. <laughs> I was like, Pokemon Go! Sorry, carry on, <laughs> The musical Waitress is beautiful, but mm -hmm. when he sees me, it's a beautiful song. It is a great song. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, we have social media where you can contact us. Um, we have an Instagram, which is at Liliana Pod. Um, we have a Twitter, which is also at Liliana Pod. Um, and a Tumblr. And then we also have an email, which is Lily Anna's pre read media tech at hotmail.com. Um, yeah. All yeah. of these links are going to be in the description. So, of course. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And you can listen to our podcast uh, well, where you're listening to it currently. We're on Anchor, we're on Spotify, we're now on Apple Podcasts. Hooray. Woo. Woo! Um, and also Google Podcasts. Yes. Yes. We're in a bunch of different places. If we're not on your podcast place of choice, please let us know and we will do that. We'll sort that out. We have an RSS feed so we can apply and get our podcast there and because yeah. of loretta being lovely and telling me that we were not available on apple podcast that's how i found that out so <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah please let us know yeah again thank you for listening to us this was a long one but we love this um, movie and this book so thanks and have a lovely evening wait, wait, morning the joke the joke oh Anna. shit <laughs> I'm gonna cut that out. I'm not gonna say no, no, we're, so gonna, much. we're gonna have that. We're gonna have that. <laughs> we're keeping it. And as always, we're gonna end with a dad joke. Uh, as always, yeah. As, <laughs> as Anna remembered, as always. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so Lily, I watched a documentary on Netflix actually about prohibition last night. Oh really, Anna? Um tell me more. It was pretty dry. <laughs> oh, that's really good. Oh, thank you. What a way to end. What a way to finish. Do you want to hear that another was... one? Yeah, 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 go for it, go for it. How did mathematicians get around restrictions of prohibition? I don't know, Anna. How did mathematicians get around restrictions of prohibition? They drank their root beer out of square cups. Uh, don't get <laughs> maths jokes, no. <laughs> so, I I know, mean, that felt so American to me because I don't, I've never had root beer. 
Oh, you don't, you don't. Oh, something. get around prohibition. Wait, there's so many layers to this joke. I don't understand what's going on. I didn't no, get the like, joke out or I didn't get it. Wait, you know, what? like Explain the root it. of, like the root of nine is three. Yeah. And they drink their root beer out of square cups. <laughs> This is worse than the cheese grater. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we'll get around prohibition there. <laughs> I don't get it. I just don't get it. Oh no. <laughs> Maybe by our next episode, I'll understand. It makes no sense, but also, like, it's just not funny enough to, like, if I explain it, it's going to get worse. Okay. I'm going to do one more try, and then we're going to stop the recording. Um, where did Prohibition-era rodents get their alcohol? I don't know, Anna. Where did Prohibition-era rodents get their alcohol? The squeak easy. Uh... <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop. I did get that one. <laughs> Thank you.